As the Hollywood cliche goes, poised coital, some of us sit back against the headboard, proud of our accomplishment at gratifying our lover, spouse, or one night stand, and then light up a cigarette. How was it for you? Good enough, you surmise, as you take a well-earned drag? Or are you the kind of person to roll over in an instant, perhaps leaving your bedfellow exasperated and hardly ready to catch some Z's? Or perhaps you spare just a moment reposing, and then compose yourself and start again? Do you cuddle up? Have a chat? Talk about deep things? Or even request a favor of your lover? According to research, these are all common. But what happens to our bodies during and after sex? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what happens to your body while you are having sex? Today we'll talk about what happens to both men and women having heterosexual sex, and when we say sex, we mean intercourse, lovemaking, copulation, fornication, or as the Brits say, having it off. So, let's start with the man. What happens to him? At some point during sex, men reach a point of no return. This is sometimes called ejaculatory inevitability. Pulse rate and blood pressure rise, the sperm leaves him, and his penis has contractions. Now he can return to resting and let his body calm down, which apparently happens faster for men than women. The penis becomes flaccid, and most men will have to wait some time before they can go at it again, but it all depends on age, fitness, and of course the urge to return to the hearth of passion. Some guys at this point will just want to go to sleep. Is this plain rude, or is it a biological necessity? Well, listen up disgruntled women. Science says it's natural for men to want to sleep, and for various reasons. Notwithstanding the obvious, in that it's often nighttime and tiredness might be normal, another reason is because upon reaching orgasm, men release lots of pent-up anxiety. So do women, and they might feel tired too, but it seems men sleep more after sex, according to research. Another thing is brain chemistry. All these chemicals spill out in the brain when men ejaculate, including serotonin, oxytocin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. Some of these chemicals are related to de-stressing and the readiness to sleep. This can lead to that feeling of, phew, and then men want to relax just as they would after any strenuous exercise. It's kind of like getting a hit of morphine, and apparently that hit is much stronger when having sex than when masturbating. One doctor puts it like this when talking about the release of chemicals. They give you a very relaxed feeling, slow down your brainwaves and cerebral functioning, and make you feel pleasantly tired. But it's thought the hormone that is released called prolactin is the main reason men want to sleep. It gives you satisfaction, and the less of it you have, the more likely you will go for round two quicker. Really satisfied men may just turn over and start to snore. Another thing is, is that he might want to go for a pee. The reason? It's chemicals again. Oxytocin and prolactin affect the kidneys, and this makes him run off to the bathroom. Some experts also think it's to clean the urethra from bacteria, a kind of natural need. It might also just be because he's been holding it in during all that messing around. He then finds the pee won't come out. That is normal, because for the sperm to come out, your internal sphincter muscle clamps, and this is to close the bladder. This is to stop the semen from entering the bladder. In a recent article in Cosmopolitan magazine, it was suggested that men who want to cuddle are keepers, but it also says that men who don't might just be succumbing to their own body's demands. You might find that your penis feels a bit sore, but this is just normal after all that contracting. Don't worry, it shouldn't last long. And don't be shocked if your testicles have shrunk, because this is normal too. A doctor talking to Men's Health magazine explained it like this. When you ejaculate, the cremister muscle contracts and brings your testicles up closer to your body, giving you the perception that they're smaller. Lastly, you may get a cramp in the toe. Apparently this happens a lot, but it's just because orgasm causes stimulation in the nerves, especially S1 in the spinal column, and that nerve affects the toes. If you look at some research, it also says some men's moods change dramatically after sex, but given the release of all that tension, and all those chemicals flooding out, that's not so surprising. Some men have reported feeling emotionally handicapped after a great orgasm, and that's thought to be because huge amounts of dopamine were released. It's like coming down from a drug that makes you feel happy or ecstatic. In women, the feelings can be similar, as we shall see. So, what about postcoital women? Well, women may not always orgasm. According to an article in Psychology Today, which cited a number of studies, around half of women will regularly orgasm during intercourse, about 20% of women rarely orgasm, 20% consistently orgasm, and 5% never orgasm. When they do, it's different from a man's one great push to the sun, as women have what has been called rapid rhythmic contractions. This can be quite the event, and some women certainly show this in their face, sometimes looking like they've had an ecstatic experience. These shockwaves go through her genitals, her anus, her uterus, and her pelvis, and she too will have a magnificent rush of chemicals flooding through her brain. 
She may experience female ejaculation, which is when a milky liquid will come out of her urethra. Don't worry women, there's nothing wrong with this. But what about when a lot of liquid comes out? A neurophysiologist from Rutgers University in Newark says it's not the same milky stuff if it comes out in large amounts. In that case, she says, it is urine diluted with substances from the female prostate. Scientists are still not clear as to why some women do this and others don't, but it's certainly not harmful. So, why are women often up for a chat about tomorrow's activities or the meaning of life while some men are already halfway to La La Land? According to a study in the Netherlands undertaken in 2005, women are more focused than men during sex, their minds completely set to the task of reaching orgasm. This is because their amygdala and hippocampus, which regulate feelings, kind of turns off. They are at one with sex, well, at least if they are fully immersed in it. Once we've come, we return to our bodies, our consciousness recalibrates, and our emotional intelligence returns, said an article in Bustle about this phenomenon. But after sex, they switch back. And it's then they get that lovely hit of oxytocin, sometimes called the cuddle chemical. One study found that people with high levels of testosterone release less of this after sex, and men generally have high levels. Some women do too, of course, just not as much. So men, next time you turn over, blame your lack of oxytocin. And women may not experience a refractory period at all. This is the downtime men need to get ready to do it again. Note, teenagers may not need much downtime, but then again, sex doesn't always last that long for these hyper-carnal kids. Women are multi-orgasmic, and they usually could just start again. But be careful there, women, because sex can be more painful for you than it can be for men. Women might cramp up in the uterus, and this is due to the cuddle drug, oxytocin. Let's now call that the double-edged sword chemical. There might also be some burning because of the vaginal tissues getting dry, but lubrication can help. The stinging doesn't mean there is a problem, but obviously if it persists longer than a day or two, it might be something else. And if men see shrinkage, then women see the opposite. In their breasts, at least. Many women's breasts get bigger after sex, and in some women, by as much as 25%. According to Women's Health magazine, just how swollen the breasts become differs from woman to woman. The same article also said a woman's clitoris will become very small at point of orgasm, almost disappearing. At the same time, women's nipples may become more sensitive, but this is very natural. Other reports say some women become giddy after sex, and others feel great confidence, seeing their bodies as much more attractive than before. Most reports we can find state that while some women may experience a slump after the sex, it's the men that really suffer from depression, sometimes a week long. But as the saying goes, what goes up must come down, and most of the time, it's worth the ride. Some call it the elixir of the gods, others call it hooch. A fancy cocktail might taste good, but it comes at a price. Your health. Let's find out what the actual benefits are to giving up alcohol. Seconds after you stop drinking, your liver slowly filters out the toxins and sugars found in the alcohol. The molecule ethanol is what makes you feel drunk. It does this by binding to receptors in your brain. Most notably, ethanol binds to glutamate neurotransmitters, which in turn causes the brain to respond slower to stimuli. Along with glutamate neurotransmitters, there are several other receptors that ethanol binds with that slows brain function. The result of these inhibited receptors is what we call drunkenness. The reversal of this process can take a while, and the hangover that ensues after a heavy night of drinking is a mix of your body trying to get rid of the ethanol and other harmful molecules, along with dehydration. Unfortunately, if enough ethanol builds up in your system, it can kill you. After about an hour, your body has filtered your blood several times and metabolized the drinks you've had. The time it takes your body to break down the alcohol directly correlates to the amount consumed. About an hour after you stop drinking, your body starts to feel tired due to the high amount of energy it uses to remove the alcohol from your blood. And since it takes about 6 hours for your body to completely break down all the ethanol in your system and bring the sugar, water, and other nutrient levels back to normal, the lingering effects of drunkenness will persist. After you've had your last sip of alcohol, your body needs to rest more than usual to recover from your attempts to poison it. Unfortunately, until you get past this stage, it's difficult to have a good night's sleep. In fact, research suggests that alcohol actually increases alpha wave patterns in your brain, which are only supposed to be present while you're awake. This implies that alcohol tricks the brain into thinking the body is awake when it's really trying to sleep. But there is good news. If you manage to not drink for 6 to 12 hours, your body physically starts to change for the better. For one thing, alcohol has been shown to weaken your immune system. This might leave you susceptible to viruses and bacteria that are present at bars and parties. About 24 hours after you stop drinking, however, your immune system returns to normal. This is the first of many changes that will occur from sobriety. If you're a heavy drinker or an alcoholic, another much more noticeable change to your body will occur around 24 hours after you stop drinking. This is when withdrawal really starts to kick in. Your body may still crave the chemical changes that occur when you drink. 
and therefore you would start to develop symptoms such as the shakes, cold sweats, increased pulse, nausea, and anxiety. These will eventually pass, but the amount of time these withdrawals last is based on each person and how much alcohol they usually consume on a daily basis. Congratulations, if you make it to three to five days without drinking, the real benefits of sobriety start to kick in. You may find that your blood pressure begins to drop and you will overall feel less stressed. Doctors often recommend that people with high blood pressure reduce the amount of alcohol they consume. So even if this is not your goal, less than a week after you stop drinking, your body will be grateful for that much needed break. You also might notice your appetite begins to decrease about a week after you stop consuming alcohol. This is one of the reasons that people tend to lose weight when they quit drinking. The other reason is that on average each drink you're consuming contains a couple hundred calories, and since the sugars and alcohol don't break down in your body very well, much of it gets stored as fat. If you can give up drinking for an entire week, you may also find your skin looks and feels better. This is because your body is now more hydrated. Not only does alcohol make you pee more often, but it also decreases your antidiuretic hormone levels, which plays a role in allowing your body to reabsorb water. Somewhere around the seven-day mark after you stop drinking, these hormone levels are back to normal and your body is retaining more water. This is good not only for your skin, but for your body overall. Again, it's important to remember that the time between when you stop drinking and start seeing these benefits will vary depending on the person and how much alcohol they previously consumed. A couple of weeks without alcohol, and you might find your cognitive abilities start to improve. This is because the brain, like many parts of your body, is resilient. The damage done to your neural pathway by the ethanol can be reversed. You will never regain memories from when you blacked out while drinking or recover thoughts that were obliterated from overconsumption of alcohol, but many of your neural connections will heal themselves over the coming weeks and months. You'll see even bigger benefits if you quit for more than one or two weeks. Without the pressure of filtering alcohol, your kidneys will begin to repair themselves. Like the liver, the kidneys filter out toxins. They're not quite as affected by alcohol as the liver is, but overconsumption can definitely cause damage over time. After a couple of weeks of no drinking, the kidneys will heal enough to maintain proper fluid levels, waste excretion, and hormone balances. If enough damage is caused to the kidneys from excessive drinking, you will feel much better once they're healed. The organ that takes the brunt of the damage when you drink is the liver. It's a vital structure and without it you can't survive. So about three weeks to a month after you completely stop drinking, your liver will begin to thank you. It's around then that the tissue will start to regenerate fully and the liver will repair itself. Without having to worry about alcohol, the liver can focus on breaking down other toxins that are produced by the body, which overall will make you feel healthier. The regeneration of damaged tissue takes time, but it happens much quicker when you stop drinking. A month or two after your last sip of alcohol, your liver will begin working at full power again. Just reducing the amount of alcohol you consume on a weekly basis can be beneficial for your liver. But if you really want to thank this vital organ for all it's done to keep you alive, there is nothing better than giving it a rest from breaking down alcohol. And if liver regeneration wasn't a big enough benefit, there's another major change that will occur to your body after not drinking for around a month or two. I'm sure you've heard that a glass of wine a day can improve the health of your heart. Well, too much drinking can also damage your heart and increase your chances of having a heart attack or a stroke. Around two months after you stop drinking, your heart will have repaired most of the damage caused by overconsumption of alcohol. However, the best thing you can do to increase heart strength is to exercise. By reducing or completely stopping your alcohol consumption and exercising more, your heart can become stronger and healthier. Even though this next change doesn't directly impact your body, something amazing happens when you stop drinking for a few months. Your bank account suddenly starts looking healthier too. Having more money could lead to less stress in your life, which would definitely be beneficial to your health. Research has shown that people who drink socially end up spending between $500 to $1,200 on alcohol annually. But if you live in a more expensive city and enjoy going out for drinks frequently, these numbers can be much higher. People who stopped drinking have noticed that the money they saved was enough for a down payment on a car or to take the vacation they've always wanted to go on. These are clearly positive impacts on your life that may result in less stress and increased happiness. Interestingly, stress has a very similar effect on the body as alcohol does. It can increase blood pressure, cause heart problems, negatively affect your skin, and cause depression. Months after you stop drinking, your body might feel a hundred times better due to a combination of less stress and allowing your organs to repair themselves. One of the most surprising changes to your body after you stop drinking happens without you feeling anything. The US Department of Health and Human Services has found that alcohol can be a carcinogen. This means that there's a chance the substance can cause cancer. The research suggests that people who consume large amounts of alcohol are at a higher risk for certain types of cancer, which makes sense when you think about it. Since your body technically sees alcohol as a toxin and your liver is responsible for removing that toxin, it's no surprise that people who are heavy drinkers have a high risk of developing liver cancer. 
Some research also suggests that alcohol can cause an increase of cancer in the esophagus as well. More research needs to be done, but there does seem to be a correlation between heavy alcohol consumption and increased risk of cancer. This means that once you stop drinking, you're actually lowering your chances of your body developing cancer, and this benefit doesn't just persist for a few years, but for the rest of your life. Just to be clear, most doctors and scientists agree that occasionally drinking alcohol poses very minimal health risks. In fact, consuming alcohol in moderation might have some health benefits. However, health problems arise when overconsumption occurs. But to be fair, this is true with almost anything you put into your body. When you stop drinking, your body goes through several changes over time. But even if you only reduce the amount you drink, similar beneficial effects can occur. If you're planning to do something like sober January or want to cut off alcohol for a bit and see how it goes, just know that you will definitely feel better after the initial shock to your system. However, the health effects that come from long-term sobriety probably won't occur in just a single month. If you want to drink from time to time, that's okay. You can still receive some of the benefits mentioned in this video just by limiting your alcohol consumption to one drink or less a day. By reducing alcohol intake, your body can recover and you can live a long and happy life while also having a glass of hooch every now and then. Fasting is the new fad, and if you check numerous forums where people talk about their fasting experience, you'll find it has helped a lot of people lose weight. You'll see people talking about how they tried all kinds of diets, the low carb, the keto diet, low fat, reduced sugar, all kinds. But for some folks, none of those worked for them. Then they fasted, and the weight came off. On top of that, they talk about mental clarity, feeling light on their feet, more agile. You can watch David Sinclair, a professor in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School, telling people they should skip meals, something in the past that was seen as an unhealthy way to live. So what actually happens when you fast, either doing the short intermittent fasts or the grueling five-day fasts? Let's find out. Harvard University is where we decided to go to find out about intermittent fasting, only because we believe we can trust the school's research over some other more dubious health guru websites. Scientists at Harvard, including David Sinclair who we just mentioned, have done all kinds of tests on rats to see what makes them healthier or unhealthier. When it comes to fasting, the rats came out looking pretty good. The results were often the same with any of the rats on a fast. It would lose weight, and its blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugars would often improve. The US National Institutes of Health agreed that when rats fasted, there were health benefits, including a more efficient energy metabolism. That's rats though, not humans. So what scientists then had to find out is would humans get the same benefits? Should we give up three square meals a day or lots of small meals and just deprive ourselves of food now and again? Let's have a look at what happens to the body when we fast. The experts tell us that when we don't feed ourselves for somewhere between 12 and 16 hours, our glycogen stores in our liver become depleted. The body then switches from using sugar as a source of energy to using fat. If you did a lot of exercise, this can also happen. This metabolic state that happens during this time we call ketosis, and this brings about changes in the body. Most of us don't actually reach this state because we've grown up being told to eat when we're hungry, don't go to school on an empty stomach, or we just put sugar in that morning coffee at the office. Fasting means trying to avoid calorie intake, although there are some that say that a few calories might still keep your body in the fasting state. That's debatable, as some say only have water or tea. As we said, some leading researchers around the world did lots of tests on rats, allowing some to eat what they wanted and others were only given food now and again. This is the conclusion we found in one paper that was published by the National Institutes of Aging. Emerging evidence suggests that intermittent dietary energy restriction might improve overall health and reduce risk factors for diabetes and cardiovascular disease in humans. Our new findings in laboratory animals provide evidence that similar intermittent eating patterns can enhance the beneficial effects of aerobic exercise on endurance performance. You can read a lot of books on why our obesity crisis happened, and the long and short of it is many people are too sedentary, or just eat way too much and way too much sugary processed food. It won't surprise you that the book The Obesity Code tells people they shouldn't constantly be snacking and they should try and eat healthy foods, more veggies, fruits, healthy proteins, and less refined grains, processed foods, and sugar. It's no surprise that some of the fattest countries in the world have a snacking culture and a fast food culture. Still, some people do eat quite well and can't seem to lose weight. It's as if the body has a certain calibration and wants to stay at a particular weight. That's where fasting has helped people. It's worked where diets have failed. You see, there's some evidence that even when we restrict our bodies of calories, the body thinks, oh god, I'm starving, and so it slows down and takes what it can from the few calories you put in. Even if you're a big person, if you reduce calories, you might not lose weight because your body goes into survival mode. It slows down its metabolism. 
If you watch enough Joe Rogan, you'll know that this is an ongoing argument, but what most people do agree on is that fasting seems to work for most people. But if you look at human studies, which had some people on a plant-based healthy diet and some others doing one-day fasts, the results weren't much different. Some people lost weight, others weren't affected much at all. Then again, there's lots of evidence out there from people who actually tried fasting and the results for most people were positive. But we'll get around to that later. Researchers from the University of Alabama were interested to see if fasting might help people with prediabetes, meaning that they were on their way to getting full-blown diabetes. It's well known that if you eat a ton of food before you sleep, it can increase your chances of getting diabetes. We don't need to tell you that if you are very obese because your fingers are hardly ever doing anything other than putting chips, cookies, and all kinds of processed junk into your mouth, you're at risk of getting diabetes. The proof is in the pudding, and America has a big pie of evidence. In 2018, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention told us that one in seven Americans has diabetes. And while lifestyle is not to blame for around 5% of the cases, the vast majority of the remaining 95% have diabetes because of a poor diet and resulting obesity. So can fasting help? Well, in one study, the researchers put pre-diabetics on a plan called early time-restricted feeding. This meant some participants could only eat from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. and nothing else after or before. The other group could eat between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., a kind of normal time frame for most people. Both groups actually didn't gain weight or lose weight, but those in the 7 to 3 time frame showed a drop in insulin levels. They also showed a lower blood pressure, and another important factor was they just got used to it and showed a decrease in appetite. There is no doubt that this kind of intermittent fasting has worked for a lot of people, but most researchers do say that if you do it, also try to have a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle. Dieting may also help, but the fact is some people just find it easier to skip meals. Sometimes it's hard to find healthy food and sometimes it takes too much time to cook. So fasting is a good option if you want to try and lose weight without much planning or effort. What about fasting not just for a certain part of the day but missing an entire day's foods? The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a study from independent researchers who took a bunch of participants and put them on this one day a week fast for five weeks. Its conclusion was that indeed people lost weight, but they were also hungry during that fasting day. It said perhaps adding one healthy meal in a fasting day would be better. That's why you'll hear a lot about 16-hour fasts, 18-hour fasts, 20-hour fasts. Maybe start with the 16-hour fast and build up to 24 hours. All over the web, there is scientific and anecdotal evidence that fasting can help reduce a person's weight and also help people with type 2 diabetes. Some evidence also points to fasting increasing something called the BDNF protein in the brain, which is why some people claim they have enhanced mental clarity when fasting. Others say that giving the body a break from food can help reduce pain and inflammation and also help repair cells. Some studies have concluded that chronic pain can be eased if fasting is done in tandem with a vegetarian diet. While there is some quite strong evidence that tells us that fasting might help with other chronic degenerative and inflammatory diseases, we found one paper in which scientists wrote that fasting might help regenerate stem cells and so could have a positive effect on cancer patients. Studies on animals show that fasting might even reduce the chances of getting Alzheimer's disease or heart problems, but so far these studies have been done on animals so right now we should say it's only a possibility it could do the same for humans. We should say, however, that doctors don't recommend pregnant women fast, nor malnourished people, nor people with a history of eating disorders, children, or women who are breastfeeding. Basically, it's best to do it when you're an adult and you feel like you need to lose some weight or lower your blood sugar. During your fasts, drink lots of liquids, mainly water or tea or coffee with no sugar or milk. You can also work out, and don't worry, it's not dangerous to do that according to the health experts. Some people online say they feel great exercising on their fasts, but others have said they felt weak or got a headache. If you do it, take it easy and see how you feel. Just head to any forum and see what people are saying about intermittent fasting, and indeed you'll find scores of people saying that they lost weight, felt more mentally alert, while after fasting they just didn't need as much food as before. As one doctor said online too, his clients found fasting a lot easier to do than following a strict diet plan. Looking at forums, you'll find lots of people saying things like this. Yes, intermittent fasting is very helpful. I've lost 30 pounds, went from 20 plus percent body fat to 8 percent so far just from this march. I've been doing it every day since. There seems little doubt that many people lose weight when doing these fasts, even just 16 hour fasts. Most people will eat their evening meal early around 5 and then get through most of the morning without food. 
While a lot more research needs to be done concerning all the health benefits, just reading what people say about their fasts online lets you know that fasting does work for most people if they want to lose weight, while many people enjoy how they feel during the fasts. Sex is everywhere. It's in the news, in the YouTube videos you watch, and practically every television show or movie you've ever seen. But what happens if you never have sex? Would you explode? Would you die? The answer might surprise you. Having sex definitely provides physical and mental health benefits for the participants, so it goes without saying that if you never have sex, you miss out on some of these advantages. Then again, if you've never had sex, you wouldn't actually know what you're missing in terms of pleasurable sensations. But even if you don't know what you're missing, your body does. It's important to remember that everyone is unique and everyone's body will react in different ways. But let's look at some common physical and mental side effects of never having sex. First, we'll look at the physical ramifications to the body if someone never has sex. There are a lot of misconceptions about what will happen to your body from lack of sex, which we'll debunk later. But the truth may be even scarier. Men who have regular sex and ejaculate more frequently have a lower risk of prostate cancer. This means if you never have sex as a male, you're actually at a higher risk of getting prostate cancer. The reason for this is because humans evolved, like all living things on this planet, to be reproduction machines. Whether you like sex or not, your body's main purpose is to reproduce produce, because that's how all living things evolved. The body needs to release old sperm in order to create newer, more viable sperm. Just like with other equipment, if the male genitalia is not frequently used, there can be problems or a breakdown in the system. It's not yet clear what the precise cause of prostate cancer is, but studies suggest that men who have frequent sex or ejaculations tend to have a lower risk. So if a male never has sex, he should be at least masturbating. This will be a common theme here, because some of the benefits of sex can also be obtained from self-release but not all. Either way, if you're a male who never has sex, you should consider doing regular prostate checks. For females that never have sex, there are different repercussions to the body. Sex strengthens the pelvic floor muscles that support the bladder. If a female never has sex, they may find themselves with a weak bladder. This could lead to leakage or incontinence. Sex is a physical activity, and the muscles involved need a workout every now and then. If you never have sex, these muscles aren't exercised, which leads to them becoming weaker. Turns out that if females are not strengthening the muscles used during sex, it can lead to negative effects on other body systems. That being said, females can also achieve the benefits of sex from self-pleasure as well. It turns out that in humans, just simulating the act of sex can trick the body into providing many of the benefits associated with the act. Another negative effect women who never have sex may encounter is that the vagina may be drier than someone who is engaged in sexual activity. This is not necessarily a problem other than it can be uncomfortable. So if a female has never had sex and feels discomfort in her genitalia, it may be because of a lack of lubrication around the muscles and organs. Again, this problem can be solved by masturbating. At some point in their life, someone who has never had sex may want to engage in the activity. If this is the case, the lack of sex in previous years may hinder the carnal act. If someone has gone their whole life without having sex, it could take longer than expected for arousal to begin. This could happen because the body would be feeling all new sensations, and since they would be different than anything felt before, it could take a while for the necessary fluids to flow. This seems counterintuitive, since you would expect someone's body who has never had sex to be raring to go. However, the longer someone goes without ever having sex, the longer it takes for the body to prepare for the activity. Your body needs to create and dump hormones into the bloodstream, and then increase the blood flow to areas of the body that have never or very infrequently been used. This can take a while, especially for someone who has never had sex before. Whether someone is male or female, never having intercourse can be connected to higher blood pressure. There are several studies that show people who have regular sex tend to have lower blood pressure. Therefore, or the opposite can also be true. Someone who has never had sex may have higher blood pressure than if they did have coitus. The most likely reason for this is because there is a correlation between having sex and the lowering of stress hormones in the body. If a person never has sex, those same stress hormones will be higher. Someone who has more stress tends to have higher blood pressure. This is a serious health concern a celibate person should be aware of. They should absolutely find other ways to lower their stress levels and blood pressure. Like we've said before, this can be done through masturbation, but there are other options as well, such as meditation. Again, our bodies evolved to be sex machines, therefore they expect to have a release every now and then. High blood pressure would definitely be a negative side effect of never having sex, but there is something else that sex might help your body with that you weren't even aware of. Having sex, or more specifically having orgasms, has been linked to benefits to someone's immune system. Psychologists 
Carl Charnetsky and Francis Brennan Jr. conducted a study where they took saliva samples from people who frequently had sex and those who did not and found some surprising results. In the patients who were having sex, their saliva contained higher concentrations of immunoglobin A, which is an antibody used to fight off the common cold. Therefore, there may be health benefits to the immune system of someone who is having sex. If this is true, then someone who has never had sex may find themselves getting sick more frequently than others. The reason for this boost in the immune system may have more to do with the close proximity to another human during sex than the act itself. So unfortunately, this boost to your immune system may not be something you can get from masturbation since it's only a party of one. So it would seem that never having sex may have negative physical effects on the body, but what about the mental effects? Are the people who never have sex at risk of having higher mental health issues? Since everyone is different, there is no absolute definitive answer, but someone who has never had sex may be at a higher risk of certain negative mental health issues. As we said before, the act of having sex releases certain hormones that lower stress levels in the body. This can be achieved through masturbation as well, but another important mental health benefit of sex is the feeling associated with physical intimacy, something that cannot be obtained through self-pleasure. Someone who has never had sex before may develop what psychologists call skin hunger or touch starvation. This is when lack of close physical contact results in negative mental health issues. The intimacy during sex cannot be replicated even if someone spends a lot of time around other people. The physical contact and sensations during sex are sometimes necessary. If someone has never had sex, it could cause their body to react negatively to the lack of intimacy. It would not be surprising for someone who has never had sex to feel isolated or insecure. This could be caused by an imbalance in hormones in the body due to a lack of sexual contact. The change in chemical composition of the body from sex is not just because it feels good or pleasurable, but because it's something intimate and shared between individuals. If someone who has never had sex is feeling depressed or lonely even if they're surrounded by others, it could be because their brain is craving intimacy. In these cases, we only have evolution to blame yet again. Our DNA is selfish and wants to be passed on to the next generation. Therefore, almost all of us are programmed to want to have sex. One way our body tricks us into copulating is by rewarding us not just with pleasurable physical sensations, but with mental stimulation as well. The brain of someone who has never had sex could be starved for intimacy of it. This, in turn, could cause negative side effects to mental health. So really, for someone who has never had sex, their brain begins to rebel against them. When your brain is fighting you, it's going to be a bad time. However, as mentioned before, everyone is different. Some people actually don't need to have sex at all and are still healthy and happy. This can be because of a low sex drive or that the person is asexual. The human brain is a magnificent thing and can even overcome our biological urges in some people. In others, the brain may be programmed to just not crave sex, and for these individuals, never having sex most likely comes with no side effects. There are misconceptions based around what happens to someone who has never had sex. So let's break them down. Someone may have told you that if a female doesn't have sex, their vagina closes up. Not only is this untrue, but think of how many other complications that would cause for that person other than not being able to have intercourse. A female who has never had sex will most likely have a smaller opening to the vagina than females who are more sexually active, but there's absolutely zero chance the vagina will completely close up. Even females who have never had sex still produce sex hormones, which means that although there may be discomfort or negative side effects from not having sex, they are still able to do so at any point during their life. What it comes down to is that everybody's body is different. Some people may choose to never have sex and can still lead a long and happy life. They may have to find other ways to mitigate some of the negative side effects, such as lack of intimacy, but it can be done. We know masturbation can produce many of the positive benefits of having sex. There are some risks to never having sex, such as a greater chance of prostate cancer in men and incontinence in women, but we live in a time where there are medical options to combat these negative side effects. What will happen to your body if you never have sex? It just depends on who you are. But for most of us, we'll feel discomfort, mostly in the genitalia, and we'll probably feel lonely or more stressed even if we are around other people. Sex is literally in our DNA, so although it may not be necessary, it could be hard to avoid. It's been a long time since you worked out. You had every intention of getting off your computer chair or going to the gym, but those infographic show videos are just so darn interesting. However, after we tell you what exactly exercising does to your body, you'll have all the motivation you need. First, there will be a little pain as your body tears itself apart, but over time your muscles will repair and you'll get stronger, happier, and healthier. But make sure you stay with us all the way to the end of the video because too much exercise can be a matter of life or death. You definitely want to know how much is too much and what detrimental effects over-exercising can have on your body. We're going to start with day one of working out. 
Whether it's been a few months since you've gone to the gym or a few years, the day you start exercising is the day your body starts to transform into the best version of itself. But this will be a long process full of ups and downs. In order to understand what's about to happen to your muscles and cells, we'll need to know what exercise does to your body. You step into the gym and take a deep breath of air filled with the smells of sweat and rubber mats. You scan the room to find an area that isn't near anyone else so you have all the space you need. You pick up some different sized weights and get to work. In between exercises, you do a little cardio. As you begin to sweat, there is a slight burn in the muscles being used, but this is normal and important process that will make you stronger. Your body shifts the flow of blood from areas like your digestive system to your skeletal muscles. Signals from the brain and hormones from your endocrine system tell your body to start converting stored sugars in fat and carbohydrates to glucose for energy production. As your muscles are put under strain, they release lactic acid that builds up and drops the pH in that area of the body. This causes cramps and muscle fatigue which cues your mind that you can't do any more reps and it's time for a break. Don't worry though, after a little rest, your body will metabolize the lactic acid and you'll be able to continue your workout. Your brain begins creating neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin that allows it to make more connections between brain cells, which aids in the movement of body parts. Without these increased connections, you'd be falling all over yourself as you tried to do burpees or jump rope. Working out takes a lot of coordination, and it's for this reason that the brain becomes incredibly active during exercise. The harder you exercise, the faster your heart starts beating as a result of rising adrenaline levels in your body. At the same time, the capillaries and all your muscles expand, allowing for greater blood flow. This allows nutrients and oxygen to reach your cells where energy production is in overdrive. The muscles in your midsection, which allow you to breathe by causing your diaphragm to expand and contract, work even harder to bring more oxygen into your lungs. As your cells generate more and more energy and your muscles work harder than they have in a long time, your body temperature increases. Your sweat glands release fluid to help it cool down and maintain homeostasis. This is one of the reasons why you feel so thirsty as you exercise. Sweat causes the body to lose water, which can lead to dehydration, so it's important to replenish your H2O supply by drinking water throughout your workout routine. You're hoping that by the time you're done, you'll be ripped, but that's not how it works. After an hour of working out, you collapse from exhaustion. As you lay on the floor, your breathing begins to slow and your heart rate decreases. You try to stand up, but you can't move. Your body's still metabolizing the lactic acid that's built up in your muscles. But if you think you're sore now, just wait until the next day. When you finally manage to get your muscles working again and stand up, you realize you now feel dizzy and your reaction time is a little slow. This is natural, as the body is still trying to return its numerous functions from a high state of stress and awareness to normal levels. It takes a toll not only on the cardiovascular system, but on your nervous system as well. The heightened amount of dopamine and serotonin in your bloodstream gets used up, and fewer signals are sent to the rest of the muscles as it's time to relax. Since your last workout, your body's been busy breaking down the fibers and blood vessels in your muscles since they were not being used frequently. This is one of the reasons your muscles shrink in the month after you stop exercising. But your body doesn't just do this to make you feel weak and pathetic. The reason it breaks down muscle fibers is to help conserve energy in parts of the body that aren't being used often. Your body requires a lot of energy just to keep you alive. So anytime energy can be conserved, it takes advantage of the situation. Because of your previous lifestyle that lacked exercise, your body needs to work especially hard to get blood and nutrients where they're needed, as there just aren't many pathways and blood vessels to your muscles as there should be. And this doesn't affect the muscles in your arms and legs. Your heart and lungs have also been working much harder than they have been in a long, long time. However, even though this first workout session was brutal, everything is about to get easier, and your body will change drastically as the result of repetitive exercise. The downside is that while you were exercising, you were also tearing apart what little muscle fibers you have. They will grow back stronger and your cells will multiply, but this process is going to be painful, take time, and require a lot of energy. When you go to bed the night after your first exercise session, you might find that you fall asleep faster and sleep better than you have in a long time. This is because your body does a lot of repairs while you sleep. While energy levels are low for the parts of the body that allow you to move and remain alert, your body can focus on using its energy to repair itself. While you're fast asleep, your cells are hard at work dividing, improving fluid distribution, and restructuring your muscle fibers to aid in growth and strength. When you wake up the next day, you stare at the ceiling and pray for death as everything aches. It's natural, and it means your body's doing what it's supposed to by fixing itself while also building up your muscles. You won't see any physical changes to your body, but you will definitely feel them as aches and pains. But you're strong, you could power through it. The damage and new growth to your body happens at the microscopic level. You're likely going to be sore for several days, and the way to reduce the pain is probably not what you're expecting. 
you will definitely need to rest your body, but it's also important that you continue to push through the discomfort and exercise again. By keeping your muscles active, you will provide them with more blood flow and nutrients. This will aid in the restoration process. You'll also need to stretch before and after every workout session to make sure you aren't just damaging your muscles, but making them more pliable and flexible. This will help them grow and allow for a wider range of motion. If you're in severe pain and can't move after a day of exercising, you did too much and went too hard. Give your body time to recover, then try again with a less intense workout regimen once you feel better. Even after a day of exercise, your body's resting metabolic rate will increase slightly. This is because it's using more energy than normal to repair damaged muscle cells. In order to get the energy it needs, your body will pull from any stores of fats that can be broken down to produce glucose. Some studies have found that 45 minutes of intense exercise can increase your metabolism by up to 40% for 14 hours after you finish working out. But there's something incredibly unexpected that'll happen after you start exercising. Even though your body requires more energy to repair your muscles, you will actually feel a drop in your appetite. It seems counterintuitive, but it's the increase of certain hormones that help the body recover that causes appetite suppression as a side effect. This doesn't mean you won't feel hungry at all, it just means you might not eat as much as you normally do. This is great if you're trying to lose weight, which is why most medical professionals recommend supplementing almost all diets with exercise. The soreness, faster metabolism, and suppressed appetite will continue through your first week of exercising. But what happens after that? When can you expect to see a six-pack and biceps of steel? One week after you start working out, your body will begin to feel better overall. If you're still waking up with pain after an exercise session, it might mean you need to slow down just a bit. But after a full week of this new exercise-filled lifestyle, most of the pains and aches should subside. Not only are your muscles growing at this point, but your brain is changing as well. Researchers have found that your body releases endorphin hormones which send pleasure signals to your brain when you work out. This fundamentally changes the way you think about exercising. After a week of consistently actively working out, your brain might begin to connect the activity with receiving endorphins. This is one reason why people who exercise regularly report feeling happier after they complete their workout. But the longer you keep up your exercise routine, the more beneficial physical and mental health effects will develop, as you will later find out in this video. Unfortunately, after a week of exercising, it's unlikely you'll see any noticeable physical changes to your body. This is where people start to falter in their exercise routine. It is a difficult mental hurdle to overcome, but the long-term benefits will definitely make it worth it. Since you've been working so hard, it's only natural to want to see results, but it's just too soon for your body to have repaired and built up enough muscle for the change to be visible. However, you will feel more rested due to getting a better night's sleep, and you probably have lost a pound or two, but you were expecting more noticeable results. As long as you can push past the disappointment and finish out the first few weeks of exercising, the next things that happen to your body will most definitely be noticeable. After one month of going from a sedentary lifestyle to exercising consistently, you'll notice that your strength and stamina have improved. You might not be at your final goal yet, but you've come a long way from that first workout session. There are now more muscle cells and fibers throughout your body, which will not only make your muscles more defined, but you're probably doing more reps, lifting heavier weights, and able to lengthen your cardio routine. You'll also notice that your body takes less time to recover after workout. This is because not only are your skeletal muscles getting bigger, but your heart has become stronger as well. It allows for more blood and oxygen and nutrients to be pumped around your body more efficiently. And something even crazier is happening at the cellular level. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. It's these organelles that turn sugar and oxygen into energy. As more cells are created to allow your muscles to grow, more mitochondria are being produced in each cell. The more mitochondria you have, the more energy can be produced. This will aid in your exercise routine, as well as the growing of new cells and repairing of damaged muscle cells. Just by exercising regularly for a week, your body will feel less tired in general because your cells are more actively converting sugars to energy. Most of the strength gains you feel during your first few weeks of working out are a result of your brain being able to use your muscles more efficiently. Now that you've built up more fibers in your muscles and your brain knows what to expect during an exercise session, your balance and ability to complete your routines becomes almost second nature. Your muscles are definitely getting stronger. But up until that first month of working out consistently, it's mostly your brain using what you have more efficiently that makes each session easier. Your muscles are now able to store carbohydrates and use them as a source of energy when needed. With each good night's rest after working out for the past month, your body has grown more and more muscle fibers and blood vessels that allow for better blood flow. This increased blood flow is not just happening in your skeletal muscles but in all parts of your body. This means your heart is pumping blood more efficiently and able to recover more quickly after an intense workout. You might also find that your resting heart rate is lower than it was before you started your new exercise routine, 
which can improve blood pressure and reduce stress levels. Life is good now, your body's definitely running more efficiently, and you're starting to notice a little bit of toning in your muscles. But there's another less attractive side effect that you notice when you work out as well. You seem to be sweating more than normal. This is actually a good thing, it means your body's become better at regulating your internal temperature. The excess sweat is your body's way of thermoregulating itself, so you can go harder for longer. So embrace that salty taste of sweat as it drips from your face. It's all part of your body's plan to keep you healthy and make you stronger. Three months after you start exercising, you'll finally see the physical changes you've been waiting for. Your muscles are now more defined. The amount of stored fat you have has been reduced as your body breaks it down to repurpose the molecules into making more muscle cells and energy. Depending on what your goal is, you might actually gain weight. If you wanted to build muscle and you were already at a healthy weight, you might put on a few pounds as the larger your muscles become, the more you'll weigh. Also at this point, your brain has been programmed to look forward to and even crave your workout sessions. The positive reinforcement that comes with the endorphins released during exercise has become a normal part of your day, and if you don't work out, you oftentimes don't feel as good. This is because your brain and body still expect the influx of hormones that comes with exercising. One year after you started working out, you might barely recognize yourself. You may have started an exercise routine before, but never made it this far. A year is a long time to keep up with exercising, as life can throw a wrench in your plans, but you've done it, and your body thanks you. Your muscle strength and endurance are much higher. On top of being stronger, you'll likely be more flexible and have less back and joint pain. This is because with regular exercise, your muscle fibers have become more elastic and stronger. Exercising also has a positive impact on bone growth which is one of the reasons your joints also feel better as well. But the best part about making it this far are the things you can't see. Since your heart is stronger and more healthy, you've reduced your risk of developing heart disease and stroke. Also, since you've been maintaining a healthy weight, you're less likely to become obese or develop diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Even if you have a cheat meal every now and then, your body can handle the extra nutrients and just uses them as fuel during your next workout sessions. You shouldn't be eating fast food all the time, but a year's worth of exercise does mean you are likely able to eat more than you used to if you want to maintain a healthy weight. Research also shows that exercising regularly reduces the symptoms of stress, depression, and anxiety. This most likely has to do with an increase in certain pleasure hormones that happens as a result of working out. Also, some studies have provided evidence that exercising regularly over several years can actually cause the brain's hippocampus to grow in size. So not only are your skeletal muscles getting bigger, but your brain might be as well. However, can too much of a good thing be bad for you? Or in other words, can you overexercise? The answer to that question is yes. So how much is too much and what can happen? Everyone is different, so the amount of exercise one person can handle might be very different than what you can handle. It's okay, it just means you need to listen to what your body's telling you. If you collapse and can't move for hours after a workout, that might mean you've overdone it. Likewise, if you're always in pain or aching after your workout, even months into exercising, it means something is wrong and you should modify your routine. But what happens to your body when you exercise too much? If you push your muscles too hard for too long, you can develop chronic muscle fatigue. Your body will feel heavy and your heart will have trouble recovering and returning to its normal rhythm. This is dangerous because too much strain on your heart can lead to a heart attack. Overworking your muscles can also lead to a rare condition called rhabdomyolysis. Your muscle fibers begin to break down and leak into your blood. If this continues, the fibers can end up in the heart and kidney, causing these major organs to fail. So in this circumstance, overexercising can actually be fatal. Another side effect of working your body too hard is that your sleep suffers. Your body uses the time you're asleep to repair itself. But if there's too much damage, this can cause pain that keeps you awake. The hormones in your body might become so out of balance that it results in insomnia. If you don't sleep enough, your body can't recover, which exacerbates the problems in the healing process even further. And even when you are asleep, your body might not be able to increase blood flow or produce enough human growth hormone to repair all the damage that it's done. If you found yourself restless at night and not getting enough sleep, it might be time to dial back the exercising a bit. Experts recommend that doing high-intensity training for short periods of time might help reset the body and allow for your sleeping patterns to return to normal. Then you can ramp up your exercise regimen once again while monitoring your body to make sure you don't overdo it. But sleep deprivation from overexercising isn't the only thing throwing your internal balance out of whack. When you exercise the appropriate amount, your body uses up stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline that are circulating in your blood. These molecules are necessary for normal life functions. However, by exercising consistently, you're keeping them at low levels, which in turn reduces the amount of anxiety and stress you feel. The problem with overexercising is that it has the reverse effect. 
With too much exercise, your body is constantly being strained, which means stress hormones are dumped into your bloodstream. This can then cause stress and anxiety levels to increase drastically. Cortisol also plays a role in helping insulin regulate glucose levels in your body. However, when cortisol levels are too high, your liver continuously releases glucose, which could lead to your cells developing insulin resistance. This means glucose levels will be too high in the blood, and your body will begin storing it as fat. If insulin resistance persists, it can lead to type 2 diabetes, and all your hard work will become detrimental to your health. On top of all this, it's unlikely that your body will be able to get enough nutrients and generate enough energy to repair all the damage done to your muscles and make you stronger. So, exercising too much actually ends up making you weaker over time. If your body needs more nutrients than you can provide it with, energy production slows and you feel tired and fatigued. Nutrient deficiency connected to overexercising has been linked to numerous other side effects such as hair loss, bone pain, and vision problems. If you're experiencing any of these symptoms, it's time to drastically reduce the amount of exercise you're doing and give your body the time it needs to recover. Oh, and maybe see your doctor. You might also realize that not only does your body hurt from working out, but that you feel like you're getting sick more often. This is because overexercising can reduce the effectiveness of your immune system. This might have something to do with the body using an extreme amount of resources to repair the damage being done to your muscles. According to the Journal of Applied Physiology, your body experiences a period of immune depression when you work out. This normally isn't a problem, but when you overwork your body, this window lasts much longer than it should, which could leave you vulnerable to infections and disease. The most important thing to know about how overexercising can affect your immune system is that the more times you push your body too hard, the longer the period that your immune system is weakened becomes. If you put yourself through an extreme workout for multiple days in a row, your immune system doesn't have time to recover, which could leave you in danger of becoming sick. Like with the other side effects of overexercising, the damage to your immune system can be reversed. But it's important to recognize that if you're exhibiting symptoms of overexercising like nutrient deficiencies, sleep deprivation, and severe pain, your immune system is also suffering, and you might find yourself with a nasty infection to go along with all those other harmful effects of too much exercise. What it comes down to is that if you're planning to start exercising regularly, you start slow and work your way up to a more difficult routine. The real damage to your body comes from doing too much too quickly. A good way to find your threshold is by starting out with some high-intensity workouts for short periods of time and seeing how your body feels. It's also important to implement some cardio, even if it's just a short jog or speed walking. You never want to go from doing no exercise to lifting hundreds of pounds or trying to run a marathon because your body won't be able to take it. Listen to your body and do what it's telling you. If you work out and the next day you don't feel any soreness at all, you might want to try pushing yourself a little harder. Conversely, if you work out and you can't move the next day because you're in so much pain, you probably overdid it. You should get some rest and give your body the time it needs to recover. Then dial back your workout routine a bit. Make sure you supplement your workout with healthy foods full of nutrients and vitamins to help your body repair the damage and growth of your muscles. Also, remember how important sleep is to the restoration of your body. When you begin your new workout routine, try to get to bed early and get a good night's rest since this is when your body carries out most of its repairs. And when you wake up sore the next day, just know that it's normal and you should try to push through it because the more you stretch and use your muscles, the stronger they'll become. Meet Jack. Jack is a master of the art of idleness. He's a slouch without a cause, a slug without a place to go. Jack really doesn't want to move. And with a phone full of apps to address his extreme laziness, he doesn't really have to. But what's going to happen to Jack over time? Well, things are going to go very badly for him. The horror will emerge slowly, but in time he's going to suffer all kinds of unimaginable things. As for the end, it won't be easy to watch for those around him. We very much doubt that there's ever been a person like Jack that just decided one day that he was never going to move from one spot again. Nonetheless, there have been plenty of people in the world who ate so much, a crane and a bulldozer were required to get them out of their house. Food did this, but also a lack of movement. We'll come back to some of those people later. You wouldn't necessarily turn into a Jabba the Hutt type character if you decided not to move for quite a while. But the fact is, if you had a regular diet, the total lack of exercise would very likely result in weight gain. How fast you'd put on the weight would depend on a number of factors. That is, it's not just about how much you eat, but what you eat and also some genetic factors. With an unmoving person, in time their metabolism would slow down. So if they kept eating at a normal rate, it just makes scientific sense that they'd get bigger. The reason is that if a person moves, the mitochondria within their muscle cells increase. One scientist called mitochondria power plants, and it's these plants that keep burning energy. But in the absence of much movement, those plants would slow down so much that the energy wouldn't get burned. It really depends on how much you eat, thanks to something called the appetite regulatory system. We receive signals when our body wants food. These signals are basically hunger, but for some reason that system is a bit hyperactive in some folks, 
and so they feel hungry easier. Let's just say Jack has not been moving around for 10 weeks now. As the saying goes, he's happy as a pig in poo. He's some way into achieving his lifetime ambition of watching every movie available on Netflix, and with the help of his eternally suffering sister, his number ones and twos have been taken care of. But because Jack has been putting very little stress on his muscles, his body has done the right thing and decreased the amount of nutrients and oxygen it sends to those muscles. His muscles are slowly wasting away. But there would be an opposite reaction if Jack decided to pump weights every day instead of watching movies. More activity in this case would make his body send more oxygen and nutrients to his muscles, and his muscles would grow. Jack doesn't really notice that he's in a stage of muscle wasting. Of course he doesn't. He's only on week 10. Things are going to get a lot worse. This is not to say Jack can't help himself. There are various forms of resistance training he could do on his bed. You might see such exercises after people have been injured or suffer from a disease that binds them to a bed or a chair. As you probably guessed though, Jack's not interested in being a good non-mover. Something Jack is also not concerned about is what's happening or what's going to happen to his skeletal system. Not only is he already packing on the pounds, his new thing is the Scottish delicacies of deep fried pizza and deep fried chocolate bars, but his bones are getting weaker. Make no mistake, Jack's body needs him to move. Don't use it and you'll lose it, as the saying goes. Non-movement will over time mean his bones are not going to get the nutrients they need. As a consequence, his bone mineral density will be negatively affected. This means a lack of movement will make his bones a bit weaker. There's now a double whammy effect for Jack. His excessively sedentary lifestyle has led to his bones becoming a little weaker. But remember, he's also lost muscle mass. Now he's got what looks like aging bones and he doesn't have the muscles to protect them. There are a number of stories in the media in which medical professionals talk about sedentary lifestyles leading to a rise in brittle bone problems, aka osteoporosis. This condition is not uncommon for older folks, but since we entered the era of sitting on our behinds all the time, there's a worrying trend of this happening to people in their 30s. It takes time to happen, of course. Jack is still happily mainlining Netflix, but it won't be long until he's the star of his own horror story. So his muscles are wasting away, his bones are on their way to becoming weaker. As for Jack's heart, he can still feel it pounding away in his chest. What he doesn't know is his heart is pounding on the door of his consciousness, screaming, get off the bed, you lazy piece of doo-doo. Major organs would never use bad language. His heart really wants Jack to get moving, for the same reason that in time it knows Jack's lack of movement along with his newfound fondness of Scottish fast food will lead to a buildup of fatty material in his arteries. Like a hose pipe full of sausages, this will restrict the blood flow to Jack's heart. Too much fatty blockage could lead to a heart attack. And if blood flow to the brain is restricted, that could lead to a stroke, although Jack doesn't have to worry too much about those things just yet. Remember though, he's intent on living out his days like this. There have been numerous studies that say a long-term sedentary lifestyle can lead to a higher risk of various diseases, such as heart disease and diabetes, and the long and short of it is that not moving much for many years will almost always result in someone having a shorter life. No doubt you've all seen those headlines, sitting is the new smoking or something to that effect. They might be somewhat hyperbolic. But there's definitely enough scientific evidence to show that a severe lack of physical activity is very likely going to have a profound effect on someone's health. What Jack is blissfully unaware of is the fact that because he's hardly moving at all, his body is producing less of something called lipoprotein lipase. This is an enzyme that breaks down fat in the blood. If you move around a fair bit, you'll produce enough of it. When you're sitting, the production level drops by about 90%. Before Jack decided to not move again, his favorite two movies were Spice World and anything from the Transformers and Fast and the Furious franchise. We don't want to upset anyone here, but we're going to say that Jack's taste in movies could be indicative of his being lacking in intelligence. Jack thought Game of Thrones was based on a true story. Anyway, he's not the sharpest tool in the proverbial toolbox, but what he doesn't know is that he's getting dumber. The lack of movement has led to a decrease in something called the brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF. This stuff grows neurons in the brain. Scientists say it's related to learning and memory, so it's good to keep it flowing. Just keep it moving and it should go. There's also some evidence that lack of physical activity can lead to a reduced cognitive function overall. You could argue though, and you'd be right, that instead of watching Spice World on repeat for an entire week, Jack endeavored to get through a history of Western philosophy, and if he went on doing stuff like that, his brain and intelligence would likely be okay. That is true, but it doesn't mean that the lack of activity wouldn't affect how he understands difficult books. There's a paper in the Journal of Comparative Neurology that discusses what happened to the brains of rats when they were forced to do what Jack did. The other groups of rats ran around on wheels and generally had a good old time. Ok, humans aren't rats, and no two rats are alike, but the scientists believe that what happened to the sedentary rats can be used as a model for humans. The result was that the spice world loving rats had something called an overactive sympathetic nervous system. This can be bad, and has been known to be a cause of heart disease and high blood pressure. 
In short, the absence of much movement at all is very likely not great for your thinking organ. It's also terrible for your blood pumping organ. Your lungs won't love you for it either. There's tons of evidence that says sitting around all day gives a person more chance of developing a clot in their lungs. This is called a pulmonary embolism, which means a clot somewhere in the blood travels up into the lungs. In one study, it was found that people who sat for 6 or more hours a day for 18 years had double the chance of developing a pulmonary embolism. Ok, you might think that sitting all day is worth the risk of such a clot, but we should tell you that they are pretty serious. If not treated, 30% of sufferers will die. Even when treated, 8% of sufferers will die from one. Now we've come to another juncture. We are going to fast forward in time and imagine that Jack has put in his 10 years of not getting off his bed. While Jack is fictional, sadly the web provides ample stories of people who have lived like Jack, and so we can assume that what happened to them could easily happen to him. Let's take the story of a British man named Paul Mason. He used to be the fattest man in the world at one point, weighing 1120 pounds. Mason had an eating habit that would put an elephant to shame, but he also had a reason. In the way of a traumatic childhood and subsequent depression, this led to outstanding binge eating in his 20s, which meant he ballooned like Jack and he wasn't able to go anywhere. Even when he went to the hospital, he had to be hoisted from his bed. Not long ago, he lost much of his weight after having surgery, but after that he still spent much of his time in hospitals. He had 8 stomach hernias and had to have many operations in his knees and hips. Unfortunately, we can't find much more about other problems, but you can be sure there were many. We know this because of what happened to many other people that were bedbound. For instance, look what happened to the American woman named Carol Yeager. She died when she was just 34 years of age, but prior to her release from life, she weighed as much as 1,200 pounds. Much of her weight, by the way, was fluid buildup, which is called edema. Because of her weight and her lack of movement, she also suffered from extremely high blood sugar levels. She was out of breath all the time too, which was the result of there being so much fat in her chest cavity. On top of that, even if she really wanted to move, she couldn't. As you now know, that's because her muscles wasted away. So much sitting then put tremendous pressure on her heart. In fact, all of her organs were failing her, which is why on her death certificate, there were the words multiple organ failure. You might be thinking, ok, these are the most extreme cases and Jack wouldn't end up like that state. But Jack, as you know, is no shirker when it comes to being irresponsible. He just kept eating even though he was getting larger by the month. Look at the case of Manuel Uribe, who died from his extreme obesity in 2014. He was just like Jack. When he was growing up, he lived in Mexico and had a fairly normal Mexican diet. Although the diet was far from being perfect when it came to avoiding obesity, he once said it included beans, rice, flour, tortilla, corn tortilla, french fries, hamburgers, subs and pizza, whatever regular people eat. At the time, he weighed just 254 pounds, which made him only a bit overweight since he was over 6 feet tall. Then he moved to the US, where he said all his problems started. He embraced the infamous American fast food culture with enthusiasm and his job, technician, meant he spent most of his time sitting. He once said, life in the United States is like that, you just go from your desk to your car. I used to drive my car to and from work, so I didn't get any exercise. The upshot was that his weight peaked at around 1230 pounds. And this, he said, was a result of eating a lot and hardly moving rather than trying to smash eating records. When his mother was asked by the press what she most wanted for her son, she said that he can get up and walk. At that point, he could only get out of bed with the help of a forklift. He did try to lose weight, but in the end, his many extra pounds caused problems that proved too much for him and he had severe heart problems. He also had liver damage, which can happen to anyone who's obese. A form of it is actually pretty common in the US, called non-alcoholic liver disease. The organ first gets fatty. That can lead to a scarring of the liver, fibrosis, and over time this can result in irreversible damage called cirrhosis. And if you think that only happens to habitual boozers, think again. About 24% of American adults suffer from non-alcoholic liver disease and you could bet your life that Jack would get it. In the end, it was said Mr. Uribe died after suffering liver failure as well as multiple cardiac arrhythmias. With these stories in mind, if Jack really didn't move much for a decade while eating anything he liked, he would almost certainly get sick, very sick, and possibly die. If he survived a decade, you can bet he wouldn't last another without some serious kind of illness. The good news for people if they really can't move but want to is that with professional help and an exercise regimen coupled with a healthy diet, while they will likely suffer some related health problems, they could at least keep the weight off. Also, good news is that if you're watching this and you know you're severely overweight and you don't do much moving, much of the damage can be reversed. There's no time like the present to get off your butt. Are you ready to instantly lose weight, gain muscle, and live longer? Well, no matter what anyone says, there is no miracle diet that can do these things for you. Staying healthy is a balance between eating the right foods and being active. However, a high-protein diet may be a good place to start. There are a lot of positive things that eating protein can do for your body, but too much protein can cause some nasty side effects. 
How much is too much, and does it matter where your protein comes from? Let's find out. Proteins are arguably the most important molecules in your body. They make up your cells, allow your body to carry out essential functions, and without protein, you die. There are over 80,000 different proteins in the human body, and each one has a function. In fact, proteins make up around 20% of your entire body, so it should come as no surprise that consuming enough protein is vital to your survival. Proteins are made up of smaller molecules called amino acids that are joined together and aligned in a unique way to create different shapes. The crazy thing is that out of the 21 amino acids used by the human body to make proteins, there are 9 that can't be synthesized by your cells. This means the only way to get them is by eating foods that have these amino acids stored in them. Which foods contain the amino acids and proteins I need to stay alive, you might be wondering? Don't worry, the infographic shows got you covered. We'll tell you exactly where to find the protein your body so desperately craves later on in the video. But let's start with the basics. When you eat something, your body tears it apart, breaks it down, and then circulates the molecules and nutrients contained within the food around your body so that your cells can get what they need. For example, you eat a slice of pork belly. The fats, proteins, and other molecules that are contained within that piece of meat don't go straight into your belly. Instead, the meat is broken down in the stomach and intestines, and the individual nutrients get circulated to every part of your body via your circulatory system. Therefore, we eat to provide our bodies with the molecules necessary to function and keep us alive, and proteins are one of the most important molecules of all. So, how much protein should you actually be eating, and what does it do to your body? Everyone's body is different, which means everyone's daily intake of protein will need to be different to provide the optimum effect. Researchers suggest that the average male should consume around 56 grams of protein per day, while females should have approximately 46 grams of protein each day. However, since everyone is a different size and weight, there might be a better way to calculate how much protein you should be eating. You should be consuming around 0.365 grams of protein a day for every pound you weigh. An easier way to think of this is for every pound of body weight, you should eat 3.65 grams of protein. This means if you weigh 150 pounds, you should eat around 55 grams of protein throughout the day. However, this is just a baseline. People who are more active will need to consume more protein to maintain or build their muscle mass. But these calculations are a good baseline to start with. Surprisingly, there's still a decent amount of debate within the scientific and medical community on how much protein someone should actually consume in a 24-hour period. Some experts put that number twice as high as previously mentioned, but more research still needs to be done to justify these numbers. Regardless of what the exact amount of protein a person should consume is, there's even a more important question. What does the protein you eat physically do to your body? Since proteins play a vital role in many life functions and literally make up the cells in your body, a better question might be, what don't proteins do? There are definitely a number of noticeable effects that a high-protein diet can have on your overall health and physiology. Scientists have found that high-protein diets end up reducing your appetite. A number of studies revealed that out of all the nutrients you consume on a daily basis, protein is the one that makes you feel the fullest. The reason for this is that protein reduces the amount of a hormone called ghrelin in your body. Ghrelin is one of the molecules that tells your brain that you're hungry. Therefore, less ghrelin in your system, the less hungry you feel. Protein also boosts the level of peptide YY, which signals the body that it's full. With the reduction of ghrelin and the increase of peptide YY, the body feels nutritionally satisfied much sooner than you would with a low-protein meal. This reduces the urge to overeat, which in turn can help you lose weight and stay healthier. In a study conducted at the University of Washington School of Medicine, people who increased the number of calories they consumed from a protein source from 15% to 30% ate around 441 fewer calories per day than someone on a lower-protein diet. The craziest part was that the people in the study were allowed to eat as much as they wanted. The group that increased their protein intake just felt fuller quicker, so they ate less. What this implies is that subbing out foods that are higher in fats, sugar, and carbohydrates for meat or high-protein veggies might make you feel more satisfied with fewer calories. Along with suppressing appetite, high-protein diets can help you lose weight in another way. High-protein intake has been shown to increase metabolism, at least for a short period of time. Even as you eat, your body is using energy to break down the food and circulate the nutrients to your vital organs and muscles. The energy expended and the increase in metabolic rate to aid in digestion is called the thermic effect of food, or TEF. The interesting thing is that protein has a much higher thermic effect than most other types of molecules like carbohydrates or fats. 
Studies have shown that by eating high-protein foods, your thermic effect can increase by 5 to 15 percent more than consuming food with little or no protein. What this means is that your body has to work harder to break down protein than other molecules. This causes you to use more energy during digestion while simultaneously increasing your metabolism. All of these factors combined can cause your body to burn 80 to 100 more calories a day just from eating. And this might be a conservative number. One study showed that a group of people eating a high-protein diet burned on average 260 calories more per day than a group of people on a low-protein diet. This is the equivalent of the amount of energy expended from a moderate workout session. Who knew that eating could be such good exercise? And speaking of working out, protein is literally the building block for all your muscles. So does eating more protein correlate to increased muscle size? Not exactly. However, increasing the amount of protein in your diet will impact your muscles in a number of different ways. Eating more protein does not necessarily build more muscle, but it does help maintain muscle mass and promote growth. If all you did was eat protein, your muscles would not magically become bigger. However, if you engaged in a weightlifting regimen on a regular basis while also increasing protein intake, your muscles would likely get larger more quickly than if you stuck to your typical diet. Someone who is active and trying to bulk up their muscle mass should definitely increase the amount of protein they put into their bodies. There's also another important factor to consider when trying to build or, more importantly, maintain muscle mass. If for some reason you need to stop lifting weights or reduce your time working out due to an injury or life just getting in the way, you should still maintain a high-protein diet. The rationale for this is that if you go from being highly active to less active, you'll begin to lose weight as your muscles shrink. However, a high-protein diet can slow the rate of and even prevent muscle loss if the right types of food are consumed. Perhaps the biggest selling point for high-protein diets is that not only will they help you lose weight, but they will help you keep the pounds off as well. Over the course of a year, high-protein diets seem to be much more effective at helping people maintain weight loss. Now, it's important to remember that just eating a lot of protein will not cause you to lose weight instantly. However, there may be some huge benefits if you stay active, eat the right types of protein, and keep track of your calories. For example, a study that tracked 130 people on high-protein diets over the course of a year found that they lost 53% more body fat compared to a control group of people on a regular protein diet. In a clinical trial conducted by the Department of Human Biology at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, researchers found that high-protein diets reduced weight regain by around 50%. This is huge for people who want to lose weight and keep the weight off. As many dieters know, losing the weight is only half the battle. It's keeping the weight off that can be hard. But it seems from a number of studies that a high-protein diet and healthy lifestyle might be one of the best ways to do just that. You probably have heard that one side effect of a high-protein diet is that it can be damaging to your bones. Is there any truth to this? The myth probably originated from the idea that protein can increase the acidity level of your body slightly, which in theory could cause calcium to leach from your bones. To be fair, if your blood's acidity was high enough, it most certainly could cause the calcium on your bones to break down and weaken your skeletal system. But if your blood ever ended up at that high of a level of acidity, you'd be dead, so it really wouldn't matter. What long-term studies have shown is that both animal and plant protein can actually help people maintain bone mass as they get older. According to some research, people who maintain a high-protein diet over extended periods of time also seem to be at a lower risk of osteoporosis and bone fractures. It's important to point out that this does not mean you should immediately start consuming mass quantities of beef to increase your bone health. There are better sources of protein which will break down for you in a bit. The same thing goes for this next health benefit. It's all contingent on what type of protein you're eating. It might seem counterintuitive, but a high-protein diet can actually lower your blood pressure. The exact mechanism for this is not completely understood yet, but in one study it was found that a high-protein diet did not just lower blood pressure, but also reduced LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. This is important because these factors in high levels can be a recipe for heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease. Although a high-protein diet can have harmful effects on the kidneys, you probably don't need to worry too much as long as you're in good health. Doctors recommend that people with kidney diseases reduce the amount of protein they eat. This is because high amounts of protein can exacerbate problems in kidneys that are already damaged. However, the same thing cannot be said about people with healthy kidneys. It's always important to follow the advice of doctors and medical professionals when they recommend lifestyle changes. However, no studies have connected high-protein consumption to causing damage to healthy kidneys. Protein may even be able to reverse and repair the damage done to the body. Since it's the building block of your cells, muscles, and organs, eating more protein actually provides your body with the resources it needs to help repair itself. Several studies have even claimed that after you suffer an injury, 
consuming more protein could help speed up the time it takes to recover. Some researchers even claim that if you're on a high-protein diet before you get injured, it may cause your body to heal faster than someone who is not. More analysis needs to be done, but it's possible that in the future doctors will recommend foods high in protein after an injury, along with other already established treatments. So we know that high-protein diets have several immediate and short-term benefits for the body. But what about as you get older? It might sound crazy, but a high-protein diet in the middle stages of life can have lasting benefits even to your more mature years. It's no secret that as you age, your body becomes weaker, your muscles start to shrink, and your bones become more frail. However, studies have shown by eating more protein, these effects can be mitigated. It's also important that you maintain some form of activity as well, because if you don't use your muscles, they will begin to atrophy no matter how much protein you eat. But eating a high-protein diet during your life and into your latter years will help your body retain some of its strength and keep you in better overall health. There are definitely a lot of positives to eating a high-protein diet, but is there a downside? Unfortunately, yes. So before you go on a meat-buying spree, make sure you watch the rest of this video. As we've said before, there is no miracle diet that can solve all of your weight and health problems. This is especially true of high-protein diets that require you to cut out all other macronutrients from your meals. You should steer clear of any diet that tells you to remove all carbs or fats from your life. In these types of situations, you could develop nutritional deficiencies such as low fiber which can cause headaches and constipation. Therefore, a high-protein diet does not mean you should remove all other types of food from your life. As we said before, the type of protein you're eating matters, and there are definitely some foods that are better than others. You should not be eating all red meat or full-fat dairy foods because they can cause an increased risk of heart disease. This is because these types of foods are often full of saturated fats and high in cholesterol. So this brings up the question, what types of foods should you be eating in your high-protein diet? You obviously want to receive the benefits of consuming more protein, but don't want to put yourself at risk for high cholesterol or heart disease. Luckily, the infographic shows got you covered. The best meats to eat to get your protein fix are a mixture of birds, fish, and one other animal that you will not believe. Chicken is a relatively low-priced meat that is healthy and can provide enough protein to meet your daily requirements. Chicken contains around 31 grams of protein for every 100 grams of meat. The best thing about chicken is that about 90% of the calories in the meat come directly from protein. We discussed earlier how important this is for speeding up your metabolism and reducing daily caloric intake. However, an even healthier option for high-protein meat is fish. Yellowfin tuna contains around 30 grams of protein for 100 grams of meat. Other fish possesses slightly less protein per serving, but not by much. However, the benefit of eating fish as part of a high-protein diet is that they also contain omega-3 fatty acids and vitamins such as D and B2. Omega-3 has been shown to be extremely good for your heart and reduce plaque buildup around blood vessels. This means that a fish is a two-for-one meal that provides both high amounts of protein and essential vitamins as well. Another seafood that's high in protein is shrimp. These crustaceans contain 23 grams of protein for every 100 grams of meat. They might also provide a cheaper way to get your daily protein from seafood, as shrimp tend to cost less per pound than high-end fish. The most surprising animal that can serve as a good source of protein isn't a fish, a bird, or a mammal. Instead, it's an insect. Crickets are an excellent source of protein. They contain around 60 grams of protein for every 100 grams of crickets consumed. Right now, crickets tend not to be the main source of protein for any diet. However, as scientists and nutritionists work to make crickets more mainstream, this is changing. The great thing about these insects is that they are plentiful, reproduce rapidly, and have minimal impacts on the environment. When they're eaten whole, crickets don't really have much of a taste other than whatever seasonings put on them. Some companies are even using crickets in their protein bars and powder. Regardless of your feelings on bugs, crickets might be the most sustainable, cost-effective source of protein we have. Meat is not the only way to get your protein, though. If you're a vegetarian or just looking for plant-based options, there are plenty of high-protein plants that will allow you to meet your daily intake goals. These foods are also healthier than eating most meats and can either be used as a substitute or an extra source of protein during a meal. One of the richest plant proteins is seitan. This durable food is made from the gluten of wheat and contains around 25 grams of protein for every 100 grams of seitan. It also boasts the highest amount of protein per gram out of any plant-based alternatives to meat. Tofu is also high in protein as well. Tofu is actually made of coagulated soy milk that's been pressed together into a block. Although this doesn't sound super appetizing, tofu has the ability to fit into almost any dish as it has very little taste of its own and its texture can change based on how it's cooked. The best part about tofu is that it not only contains high amounts of protein but is rich in iron and calcium as well. In 100 grams of tofu, there are around 20 grams of protein. Beans are also a great source of protein for anyone trying to stay away from meat. Most beans contain around 15 grams of protein per cup. 
but since beans can be cooked in a variety of ways, they can be easily added to pretty much any meal and boost your protein intake. Medical professionals recommend that most of your protein should come from plant sources. This is because they tend to be a healthier option than meat due to the fact that plants contain many nutrients and vitamins your body needs. If you only eat meat, you'll definitely have a high-protein diet, but that'll be about it. There's no substitute for a well-balanced diet, so make sure to incorporate different protein sources in your meals throughout the day. This brings us to a very important question. How much is too much protein? And what side effects can consuming too much protein have? It's always possible to have too much of a good thing in life, and protein is no different. When you consume too much protein, the risks outweigh the benefits. For example, although protein has been shown to have no long-term effects on healthy kidneys, it can still cause other problems in this part of the body. Eating too much protein can lead to kidney stones, which are incredibly painful until removed. Depending on the size of the stones, a doctor might need to use a laser to break them up into smaller pieces. There are two main ways that kidney stones can then be removed. Both are painful enough that the patient needs to be given anesthesia. One method is known as cytoscopy, where the doctor inserts a cytoscope into the urethra to locate and remove the stones. You can imagine that having anything stuck up your urethra would be unpleasant. Another method of removing kidney stones is called percutaneous nephrolithotomy. This is when a doctor cuts a hole in your side and kidney and inserts a tool called the nephroscope into it. This device then allows the doctor to look around and remove any stones they find. As mentioned before, eating too much red meat can also lead to high cholesterol and heart problems. Therefore, it's important not to restrict your high-protein diet to just one type of meat or protein source. There's still disagreement amongst medical professionals as to how much protein is too much, but there are definitely some guidelines to follow. For the average person, it's recommended you not eat more than 0.9 grams of protein for every pound you weigh. This means that a 150-pound person should not consume more than 135 grams. And this is the very upper limit. That being said, if you are someone who's extremely active or an athlete, you can probably get away with eating slightly more as your body will use it to repair and build muscle. It's when the body becomes oversaturated with protein that problems start to arise. There are some key steps you should take before starting a high-protein diet, especially if you're going to try to consume the upper limits for your body weight. The first is to discuss the decision with your doctor. They'll likely want to run some tests just to make sure your kidneys are healthy and in working order. You'll also need to do your research. We've tried to provide you with some of the best food options to eat while on a high-protein diet, but there are many other choices. Depending on where you live and what types of foods you like, there are likely other sources of protein that might be better for you. You can also talk to a nutritionist who might be able to give you further guidance. It's important to remember that although some meats have higher amounts of protein than other foods, fish, nuts, and beans can all still be healthy supplements to any meal. Regardless of what high-protein foods you decide to eat, you should still include fruits and vegetables in your diet. They might not have as much protein as meat, but they are rich in vitamins and minerals your body needs. You should also identify exactly why you are starting your high-protein diet. If your goal is to lose weight, you don't need to consume as much protein as someone who's working to bulk up and gain muscle. Or maybe you're just planning for the future and want to have a healthier body in the long run. There are many benefits to eating a high-protein diet, but there can also be risks. This is why it never hurts to discuss your dietary plan with medical professionals. You've been drinking coffee your entire adult life. Now, you've decided to quit. At first, you breathe a sigh of relief, realizing that you are no longer reliant on the drug that is coffee. But this feeling doesn't last long. Your hands start to shake, you get a splitting headache, and you feel an uncontrollable urge to run to the nearest coffee shop and shoot caffeine straight into your veins. What actually happens when you stop drinking coffee? Let's find out. The reason coffee is so addictive isn't because of its taste, but because of a white, bitter chemical found in the coffee plant's beans. We are not talking about any illegal drugs here. Instead, we're referring to caffeine. The surprising thing is that the Food and Drug Administration actually classifies caffeine as an addictive drug. It just happens to be a legal one. Your body craves the substance once it becomes accustomed to it because caffeine causes higher concentrations of dopamine to build up in the brain due to its ability to block specific receptors. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that makes you feel happy. After you drink coffee, the caffeine enters the bloodstream via your stomach and small intestine. It is then carried around the body where it activates the pleasure centers of the brain. So basically, the caffeine in coffee is tricking your body into producing chemicals that make you happy and more alert. This feeling is a good one, and therefore your body doesn't want to give it up so easily. But how quickly does it take for you to go into withdrawal after your final sip of coffee? And what long-term effects will it have on you? 
According to a study conducted in psychopharmacology that consisted of a compilation of 170 years of research, the symptoms of caffeine withdrawals can start as early as 12 hours after your last cup. And there is even worse news than that. All of the terrible feelings and changes to your body could persist for 9 days after your body is cut off from the drug. Unfortunately, some of the worst symptoms happen right away. Everyone is different and everyone's body responds differently to coffee withdrawals. However, we're about to take a journey through what will happen to most people who decide to stop drinking coffee cold turkey. Moments after your last sip of coffee, the liquid will descend down your esophagus and into your stomach. From there, some of the caffeine in the drink passes through your stomach lining and into your bloodstream. Seconds after that, the coffee will move into your small intestine, where the rest of the caffeine diffuses through the tissue and begins fully circulating around your body. It only takes a matter of minutes before this process is complete. This is why it only takes a few sips of coffee to help you feel awake. The highest caffeine levels your body will experience occur about an hour after you finish your cup of coffee. From then on, it'll all be downhill. After about an hour, your body slowly starts to use up all that caffeine that's circulating through your bloodstream. This is okay until your body realizes that it will not get a replenishment the next day. When you wake up on your first day without drinking coffee, you will feel groggy, but those nasty symptoms are just about to begin. As you walk into the kitchen and sit down to drink a glass of orange juice instead of your regular cup of coffee, you notice your hands are shaking. Actually, you might feel every part of your body begin to jitter. This is ironic because too much caffeine can cause the same symptoms due to the substance being a power stimulant that causes the nervous system to send signals through the body faster than usual. When this stimulant is removed, the same side effects can occur. Your body became so used to the extra boost caffeine gave that when the substance is removed, the nervous system slows down slightly, and the signals from the brain to the rest of the body are less constant. These signals will now be at the appropriate levels, so that's good. But your body is just not used to functioning without the help of coffee. This is one of the reasons why your first day without caffeine might start with the shakes. As you sit at the kitchen table, staring off into space, something begins to creep into the back of your brain. You're probably thinking of coffee and how you would give anything for just one sip. This is when you start to develop a headache. Besides increasing the concentration of dopamine in your body to make you feel happy, caffeine also tricks the brain into thinking there's an emergency, which some scientists think might cause adrenaline to be released. This is another reason why coffee makes you feel so awake. But the unfortunate thing is that once the body gets used to an influx in these chemicals, it starts to crave them. Without its daily dose of caffeine, the body does something strange. Instead of maintaining normal hormone levels, your body begins dumping adenosine into the bloodstream. This is a chemical that signals the body it needs rest or sleep. This change in brain chemistry is what causes caffeine withdrawal headaches to develop. Another change that happens the morning after you've given up coffee is that your blood vessels start to enlarge. This is actually a good thing because it means more oxygen can flow to the brain. However, since your body has become accustomed to shrunken blood vessels as a result of drinking coffee, the return back to normal can be painful. In fact, caffeine can reduce the blood flow to the brain by as much as 27%, which means once it's out of your system, your blood flow can increase by the same figure. This would be a shock to your system. When caffeine causes the blood vessels to narrow, your body increases the number of adenosine receptors on the blood cells, which helps them become enlarged. However, caffeine binds to those same receptors, resulting in the blood cells shrinking. When the caffeine is finally out of your system, the cells still have the extra receptors, but no caffeine to block them, meaning the blood vessels swell. The rapid shift between not getting enough blood flow because of the caffeine to getting too much blood flow can lead to withdrawal headaches the day after you stop drinking coffee. Unfortunately, this symptom can persist for the next several days. After your seething headache starts to subside, you'll notice something odd about your morning constitutional. If you regularly evacuate your bowels after your morning coffee, you are not alone. This is because the caffeine in it can actually cause contractions in the stomach, intestines, and colon that signal the body it is time to poop. For people who want to stay regular, this can be incredibly helpful, but now that you stopped drinking coffee, you might feel backed up. Caffeine also blocks the antidiuretic hormone produced in the pituitary gland, which signals the body that it's more hydrated than it actually is. This can lead to the urge to urinate more frequently while drinking coffee as well. However, on your first day off that brown liquid, your body becomes confused. Your hormones are out of whack, and the body is storing all the fluids and solids it would normally excrete after your morning cup of coffee. The crazy thing is that coffee can cause the body to start preparing itself to go to the bathroom in as little as a few minutes after drinking it. Unfortunately, your first day not drinking coffee will be filled with bathroom frustrations, as you will probably be constipated for most of the day. Besides having bathroom problems, you'll also have concentration problems your first few days after cutting coffee out of your life. As you try to make it through your first workday without 
coffee, you'll find that you are less productive. This is because your brain is not being filled with dopamine like normal, and there's a buildup of adenosine, a hormone that makes you drowsy. It'll be a struggle to stay focused and get anything done during your first day of work without coffee, but there is even worse news. The next day, you'll probably be just as unproductive. Your body's become so accustomed to the jolt of energy that's given by a cup of coffee that it'll not be able to recover in just a day or two. You could end up feeling a lack of productivity for the entire week. Luckily, there's also good news. In several research studies, it was found that after people got over their caffeine withdrawal, their productivity exceeded what it was before. This is because caffeine might give some more focus when consumed daily, but it is artificial. When the body's allowed to operate at optimum levels without the aid of an outside drug, you can be more productive for longer periods of time. You're almost through your first day of no coffee, and it's become brutal. Unfortunately, there are even worse side effects to come. As you progress through the day, you'll find yourself getting annoyed more easily and irritated by the littlest things. This is just another side effect of all the changes occurring in your body. The imbalance of hormones, feelings of being tired, lack of energy will make you wish you could curl up in a ball and just sleep until your body's passed through the withdrawal stages. Along with being irritable, you'll become more and more anxious as well. However, like most of the side effects of coffee, this too will pass and could even be better for your health. The anxiousness comes from an imbalance in all the chemicals mentioned before, along with norepinephrine and glutamate. These two are especially responsible for that anxious feeling lingering in your brain. Unfortunately, even sleep won't help you at this point. You lie in bed staring at the ceiling hoping for rest to come. You expect that since you've been tired all day, you'd just be able to pass right out. But this isn't the case. Your body is struggling to regain some form of the normalcy it had before you made coffee a regular part of your life. Unfortunately, a byproduct of this process is lack of sleep. Your first night since you stopped drinking coffee will likely be restless as you toss and turn trying to will your body to fall asleep. This is part of the addiction recovery process because even though you might have decided to give up coffee, your body's chemical processes are not yet on board. Hormone levels are still out of balance. The brain is desperately trying to cope with the chemical changes associated with the lack of caffeine throughout the day. Eventually, you'll doze off, but since you probably didn't sleep great, the second day of no coffee will be worse than the first. You will wake up even more tired than the day before. All of those withdrawal symptoms from the previous day will likely persist, along with some new ones. Countless studies have found that the main symptom someone feels after giving up coffee is fatigue. This is kind of interesting, because contrary to popular belief, coffee doesn't actually give you much energy at all. It's the way it throws your body's internal chemistry into controlled chaos that tricks you into thinking you have more energy when you drink coffee. Coffee only has around one calorie per cup, and since calories are the measurement of energy contained in food and drinks, it's clear that coffee does not give you much energy at all. On average, one egg contains around 78 calories, which means you need to drink 78 cups of coffee in order to get the same amount of energy from eating a single egg. This would be incredibly damaging to your health, so please do not try this. As day two progresses without coffee, you may start to feel depressed. Dopamine, glutamate, and norepinephrine are all chemicals that help you regulate your mood. Caffeine in coffee throws all of them out of balance. Since your body's trying to compensate for the lack of caffeine in your system, it can overcompensate when trying to regulate these hormones and return them back to normal levels. The withdrawal process can also exacerbate symptoms for people who have been diagnosed with a mood disorder. This is why you might feel sad for a few days after you stop drinking coffee. Some studies even claim that long-term coffee drinkers are more at risk of developing mood disorders, such as depression, because of the fundamental changes caffeine can make to the brain's chemistry. So once you start drinking coffee, sadness may be in your future. As you progress through day two of no coffee, you will likely feel tired, irritable, and sad all at the same time. But you know you just need to power through, and greener pastures are on the other side. A few days after you give up coffee, you might notice your blood pressure going down. This comes with all sorts of perks. Lower blood pressure is connected to lower stress and anxiety, so after a few days of going through caffeine withdrawal hell, you'll start to see some positive benefits in your body. The caffeine in coffee can cause an increase in blood pressure. It can also trick the body into going into fight or flight mode. An increase in blood pressure for a short amount of time is beneficial when trying to fight off an attack or run away from a predator because it allows more oxygen to circulate to your muscles. However, constantly having high blood pressure can be detrimental to your health. It has even been linked to an increased chance of heart attack or stroke. Less than a week after quitting coffee, your body will begin to adjust to the reduced amount of adrenaline and caffeine in the body. This will cause your blood pressure to decrease to more sustainable levels. A week or so after you stop drinking coffee, the withdrawal symptoms should be almost completely gone or at least much more manageable. If they're not, it could mean you were drinking way too much coffee. Once you start
start feeling better, you might find yourself smiling more, which is a good thing because a week or two after you stop drinking coffee, your teeth will start to gain back some of their original color. Coffee is acidic, which means it can stain or damage your teeth. Once you stop consuming the brown liquid, your body can get to work on repairing the damage it's done. Coffee causes the saliva in your mouth to dry out, which normally protects the teeth from enamel buildup. This along with the acidity can cause lasting damage. Coffee also contains tannins, which can cause the color from different foods and drinks to stick to the teeth and stain them even more. Interestingly, it's been found that brushing your teeth right after drinking coffee will only exacerbate the problem as it spreads around the acids and compounds that stain your teeth, rather than removing them. Therefore, it's recommended you wait 30 minutes after drinking coffee to brush your teeth. Now that you quit drinking this stuff altogether, your teeth are thanking you, and you'll notice that that brownish color associated with coffee-stained teeth is beginning to lighten. In the next week or two, your teeth might even be noticeably brighter. After weeks of fine-tuning, your body chemistry is almost completely back to normal. Without the side effects of caffeine withdrawal, you'll get a good night's sleep practically every night. Your brain can now more consciously spend time in slow wave and REM sleep, which are part of its restoration process. You'll also find that you need to use the bathroom less, which allows you to sleep soundly through the night. And if you usually had a cup of coffee in the afternoon or early evening just to give yourself that one last jolt before the end of the day, these effects will be even more noticeable. Studies have shown that drinking coffee even six hours before going to sleep can severely disrupt the sleep cycle, not to mention making it harder to fall asleep initially. This is because the lingering caffeine in your system is enough to trick your body into thinking it should be alert rather than resting. Two weeks after you stop drinking coffee, you'll feel like a new person, or at least the person you were before becoming addicted to the stuff. It's interesting to note that although many people drink coffee to wake up in the morning, studies have shown that once coffee is removed from someone's daily routine, they tend to feel better rested and more awake than they did when they still drank the caffeinated beverage. This is likely because there is no substitute for a good night's rest and taking care of yourself. You've now reached the long-term effects of cutting coffee out of your life. You've suffered through caffeine withdrawal, mood swings, and the re adjustment of your chemical composition, you're now enjoying some of the perks associated with a coffee-free lifestyle. But how will this decision affect you in the long run? It's been several weeks since your last cup of coffee, and you're feeling good. There's a biological reason for this. For as long as you've been drinking coffee, your body has been thrown out of homeostasis by the addictive caffeine compound. Now that it's been flushed from your system, your hormone levels are completely back to normal. Returning to normal hormone levels has been found to be especially beneficial in women, as the caffeine in coffee can throw their estrogen levels out of whack. In some women, caffeine can decrease the amount of estrogen in the body. This can lead to hot flashes, mood swings, and lowered sex drive. These aren't life-threatening conditions, but can definitely cause stress, especially if the coffee drinker doesn't know why it's happening. In other women, caffeine can increase the amount of estrogen produced, causing more severe PMS, depression, and non-cancerous lumps on the breasts and uterus. Now that the amount of caffeine ingested has been reduced over several weeks, estrogen levels are back to normal. To be clear, caffeine consumption for both men and women affects hormone levels. The longer you go without a cup of coffee, the better you will feel. There's no doubt that the days or even weeks of withdrawal sucks, but you will feel so much better in the long run. It's also been found that people who stop drinking coffee can lose weight in the weeks after they kick the habit. The reason for this is most likely connected to the substances added to the coffee, such as milk and sugar, rather than the coffee itself. A Duke University study showed that coffee, along with other caffeinated drinks, increases a person's daily sugar intake by about 10%. Now that you've removed coffee from your diet, your body is using more stored fats instead of burning the extra sugars that are in your morning beverage. This could cause you to lose weight and feel better all at the same time. However, there is something everyone should be aware of when they stop drinking coffee. Although there are benefits, and for many people they may experience weight loss, there's a chance you may gain weight instead. Coffee can suppress your appetite without you even realizing it. This means that after your body recovers from the initial shock of being deprived of caffeine, you might have a bigger appetite each morning. There are a couple of reasons for this. In the early days when your body was still craving caffeine, you might have tried to fix the problem by consuming sugar in the form of donuts or cookies. However, as time progressed, you may begin to realize that you should have been having a bigger breakfast every morning and that coffee was tricking your body into thinking it was full when it was not. There's some important thing to learn from this. After a few weeks of not drinking coffee, you might realize you're hungrier than you were previously. This is just your body telling you that you should be taking in more calories. It doesn't mean that you should be loading up on sugary foods, but that your morning routine should be filled with more fruits and cereals instead of an addictive drug found in a hot beverage. This could in turn cause you to gain some weight. But 
perhaps that's okay. Just because you gain a little weight from eating a bigger, healthier breakfast instead of skipping the meal for a cup of coffee doesn't mean you should panic. Maybe now that you're feeling better overall, you'll have more time for exercise or to pursue other activities. This could lead to you dropping whatever weight you gained while also living a healthier life. One of the most pleasing results you might see after a few weeks of no coffee could be a younger you. That's right, research suggests that removing coffee from your daily routine could result in healthier skin. Your body is no longer under the influence of the diuretic tendencies of caffeine, so it's retaining more water. This is not only good for your internal processes, but for your skin as well. Now that you're sleeping better, less anxious, and have healthier skin, your body seems to go back in time. You aren't actually becoming younger, but the damage coffee and caffeine cause to your skin and your body is almost completely reversed. One study concluded that the caffeine in coffee prevented skin cells from producing collagen. This protein gives your skin its structure and aids in repairing damage to cells, helping you maintain a more youthful look. There also might be a connection between caffeine and the disruption of DNA synthesis in skin cells. If this is true, removing coffee from your daily life could allow skin cells to multiply more efficiently. The benefits of reducing the amount of coffee you consume or giving it up completely are numerous. However, most things in moderation tend to be okay. One rumor that many people have heard about drinking coffee is that it can stunt your growth or cause bone loss. But is there any actual truth to this? The answer might surprise you. According to the National Institutes of Health's Office of Dietary Supplements and Harvard Health Publishing, there's evidence that the caffeine in coffee can affect your bones. So after you stop drinking coffee, will your bones become stronger? The answer is no. According to scientists, caffeine in coffee can increase calcium excretion and reduce absorption, but not by any significant amount. The total amount of calcium lost from drinking coffee is around 2 to 3 milligrams in someone's lifetime and has no ill effects on growth. The prevalence of this myth is actually a perfect example of correlation not meaning causation. The research studies found that people who drank more coffee tended to drink less milk and other beverages that contained calcium. The lack of calcium-rich drinks led to weaker bones, not the coffee itself. Therefore, doctors warn that if you stop drinking coffee, it will not help your bones become stronger. However, they do recommend replacing coffee with a beverage that's rich in calcium and vitamin D which will most certainly help you build stronger bones and prevent osteoporosis. What it comes down to is that removing coffee from your life will make you feel awful at first, but it's better in the long run. That being said, studies show the average American consumes 200 milligrams of caffeine a day between the food they eat and the liquids they drink. This is a little much, but probably won't kill you. However, if you take in 600 milligrams or the equivalent of four cups of coffee in a day, it could cause serious health problems. If this is you, it might be time to remove the addictive substance from your daily routine. This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. Have you ever awoken from a dream with the feeling of being paralyzed? Maybe you found yourself in a different room than the one you fell asleep in. It's the middle of the night and you have no idea how you got there. While being scary enough, these phenomena are perfectly natural and happen to millions of people every night. In fact, there's a whole catalog of weird and wonderful things that take place while you're fast asleep and circling through dream states beneath your comforter. But what's happening to your mind and body while catching some Z's and should we be concerned? Today we'll take a closer look at the neural and biological occurrences taking place while the lights are out in this episode of the Infographic Show, Things That Happen When You're Asleep. Lie down, turn off the lights, and let nature do the rest. Depending on the day you've had, you may fall asleep straight away or it may take a little while. When you first drift off, the sleep is light, non-rapid eye movement sleep and progresses deeper and deeper into NREM2 before moving on to the deepest NREM3 before finally moving into REM sleep. The rapid eye movement part of sleep is where most of the dreams occur. The brain then moves back through the cycle in the same order four or five times during an ordinary night's sleep. As the night progresses, you spend more time in the REM zones and this explains why you often wake up during a dream. Ever woke up feeling paralyzed? Well, during REM sleep, only the muscles that move our eyes are active. Dream paralysis has been experienced by us humans for years, and before we studied dreams as a science, we thought supernatural phenomena was at play. This event was often called the Hag, as our ancestors believed a witch-like woman sat atop our chests, restricting our movements. Sleep paralysis, instead, is a temporary state occurring in transition between REM sleep and wakefulness. Often the sufferer of this disturbing condition can make no major body movements or speak, but they can open their eyes so that they are aware of their surroundings. Owing to the advent of REM dream sleep, often this event is accompanied by hallucinations and can be terrifying. During our nightly escapades to the land of Nod, our brains clear out the trash. A 2013 study of mice showed that waste removal processes are most active during sleep. 
Also, new memories are being paved and stored from the day. Basically, the important information is stored away, while the non-important stuff is put into the brain's version of a computer's recycle bin. Both your heart rate and your breathing will slow down during sleep, the intestines relax and the liver slowly rebuilds itself, there's less adrenaline flowing through the system unless you're experiencing a nightmare or a particularly pleasant dream, blood pressure will plummet and the body temperature will drop. Growth hormones are also pumped out during NREM sleep, enabling us to continue rebuilding and growing. Some people even go for a walk during sleep. Sleepwalking, also known as somnambulism, is a behavior that includes walking and sometimes performing complex tasks while asleep. It is more common in children than adults. A person may walk around the house, and some have even been known to undertake long drives in the car while sleeping. It's a common misconception that sleepwalkers should not be woken up. This is not true. If you see somebody asleep about to drive their car, wake them up. Another common sleeping disorder is what we often refer to as night terrors. Also known as sleep terror, this strange event takes place during the first hours of non-rapid eye slow wave sleep. During these episodes of night terrors, people usually bolt upright with their eyes wide open and a look of fear and panic on their faces. They will often scream and sometimes violently lash out at their bedfellow. In November 2009, Britain's Guardian newspaper reported that a devoted husband and father of two, Brian Thomas, had strangled his wife to death after he dreamt that she was an intruder. Members of the jury at Swansea Crown Court were ordered to formally acquit Thomas, who had suffered from night terrors for about 50 years. A lucid dream is a dream event where the dreamer is aware of dreaming and can exert some control of the characters, setting, narrative, and general mood of the dream. Perhaps the most well-known scientist of all time, Albert Einstein, discovered his theory of relativity in a lucid dream. Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein came to her in a dream, as did Robert Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Beethoven was a prolific dreamer who used his nighttime inspiration to create. Both the Rolling Stones and the Beatles use dreams to write their songs Satisfaction and Yesterday, respectively. Dreams are essential for our survival. Although we can survive for periods without sleeping, eventually the human mind needs to enter the REM state. Randy Gardner is the holder of the scientifically documented record for the longest time a human being has gone without sleep. Gardner, a high school student from California, managed 264 hours, or 11 days and 25 minutes, Towards the end of the challenge, Gardner suffered from lack of concentration, paranoia, hallucinations, and was unable to perform simple arithmetic. What can cause your heart to work so hard that it stops beating? Junk food. What can cause your intestines to burst and spew their contents into your abdomen? Junk food. What can cause you to fall into a spiraling form of depression? You guessed it, junk food. Everyone craves junk food from time to time, but after learning what it does to your body, you might think twice before biting into a piece of fried chicken or snacking on some chips. Let's start off with what junk food actually is. Usually, when you think of junk food, the first thing that comes to mind are candy, chips, and fast food. But you can't forget about the liquids like soda, slushies, and energy drinks. Fast food options have diversified recently, and even at places like Burger King and McDonald's, you're able to get plant-based meat substitutes and salads. However, pretty much all the things you crave at those types of joints are considered junk food. No one's going to KFC and asking for a salad with no dressing or croutons. They're there for that salty, fatty, fried chicken. Therefore, when we're talking about junk food, what we're referring to is anything that has high amounts of added sugar, salt, or saturated fat in them. If you think about what you've eaten today, you could probably identify at least one item as being junk food. So, what are all these delicious yet unhealthy foods doing to your body? The short answer is nothing good. We're going to start with the short-term effects of eating only junk food before moving to the long-term health risks. Although long-term is relative, because if all you eat is junk food, you won't be alive long enough to even notice long-term effects. It's scary just how quickly junk food can change your body and cause serious health problems. Studies have shown that eating one meal made up of junk food a week can be detrimental to your health if you're not an active person. So can you imagine that only eating junk food every day will cause mayhem to all the systems in your body in a very short amount of time? The immediate effects of junk food are based on what you're consuming and how active you are. If you binge eat an entire bag of chips or a whole fried chicken, you're consuming a massive amount of sodium or salt, and after a very salty meal, your blood pressure might become elevated. This can cause all sorts of problems in the body, from fatigue to heart attacks. 
Obviously, a heart attack would be an extreme unlikelihood, and you would have to be very unhealthy for that to be a concern, but it is possible. This is especially true if you have a pre-existing heart condition or a non-active lifestyle. When you consume very salty junk food, it causes your blood vessels to constrict as the salt extracts water from them. There's a reason that over half of your body is made up of water. It plays a vital role in the circulation of all nutrient, cell function, and chemical reactions in the body. Eating extremely salty foods all the time can mess with your body's ability to maintain homeostasis or its internal balance. When your blood vessels constrict, your body needs to work harder to get oxygen and nutrients circulated to all your vital organs. On top of that, your arteries narrow, which then slows the flow of blood, exacerbating the situation even further. When all of these things happen as a result of eating too much salt, you begin to feel fatigued since your body is working harder than it should to keep you going. Now, you're probably going to want a soda to go with that salty food because you'll start to feel dehydrated. Plus, it'd be ridiculous not to have a dessert to finish off your meal, which leads to the next dangerous ingredient in the junk food you're eating. Sugar. Your body craves this stuff because it's what your cells use to make energy. Therefore, you are biologically programmed to like the taste of things with sugar in them. Junk food companies understand that at some level and take advantage of your biological programming by increasing the amount of sugar in their products so they taste good to us. These types of foods might be delicious, but they have terrible side effects almost immediately after you consume them. The problem with bombarding your body with sugars from junk food is that it forces your body to try and balance the sudden influx of glucose. Your pancreas begins dumping insulin into your bloodstream to signal to your cells that sugar is available to make energy with. Your cells then allow the sugar into them, and the mitochondria converts it to energy, hence why it's considered a powerhouse of the cell. This leads to a sugar rush which makes you feel like you have an abundance of energy. However, we all know what happens next. You crash. Any junk food that's high in added sugars will give you this rush and then leave you feeling tired because your body panics and you quickly use up the influx of sugar, depleting it in a relatively short amount of time. When there's only a little sugar left in your bloodstream, your cells slow their energy production and it leads to you feeling fatigued and groggy. It can also lead to irritability and cravings for more sugary food. These are some of the most notable short-term side effects of eating junk food. However, the high sugar content of junk food has even worse long-term effects on your body. Each day that you consume junk food, you're at risk of developing a disease that could change your life forever. Let's get into the long-term health effects of consuming junk food so that you can learn the risks to your body and hopefully modify your diet. Over time, the high amounts of sugar in junk food wreak havoc on your organs. The sudden surge of sugar and the automatic response of the pancreas dumping insulin into the bloodstream can cause all types of long-term problems. Studies have shown that people who eat junk food a few times a week dramatically increase their chances of developing type 2 diabetes. And since you're only eating a junk food diet, you're all but guaranteed to develop this disease at some point. Type 2 diabetes occurs when your body doesn't produce enough insulin, or the insulin no longer signals your cells to take in sugar and use it to make energy. This leads to a buildup of sugar in the bloodstream while simultaneously causing a dramatic drop in energy production. Type 2 diabetes can develop during a person's lifetime isn't something you have to be born with. This ultimately leads to a pancreas being overworked or damaged due to an unhealthy diet or lifestyle. The high amounts of added sugar in junk food are one of the things that can cause this to occur. The crazy thing is that with every meal you eat that's made up of junk food, you're rolling the dice with developing type 2 diabetes. Research has shown that consistently eating junk food can greatly reduce your muscle's ability to take in sugars and create energy. Given enough time, your cells can develop a resistance to this process altogether, which results in type 2 diabetes and the need for medical intervention. Left untreated, diabetes can be life-threatening. Too much of a good thing can definitely be detrimental to your health, and there is no clearer example of this than overconsumption of sugars from junk food. But there are so many other components of junk food that can lead to long-term health problems. In fact, there's a connection between eating junk food and depression. How could consuming unhealthy food lead to a change in brain chemistry? It actually has more to do with what junk food is lacking than what's contained in it. A 2021 study out of Binghamton University found a connection between eating healthy foods such as fruits and vegetables, nuts and fish, and an increase in positive mood and brain function. This begs the question, what happens to someone's brain who lacks nutrients these foods contain? Another way to put it is this, if all you eat is junk food, low in nutrients, what will happen to your brain? Nothing good, it turns out. It has been determined that junk food satisfies hunger in the short term, which seems to make the brain happy, but this is just an illusion. The brain might be tricked into thinking you've gotten the nutrients you need from the junk food due to the increase in available energy. 
but over time your brain and body cells will begin to degrade as they don't have access to the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants they need to stay healthy. Your body can only last so long on sugar and fat alone, and your brain eventually realizes this. It's not clear what exactly the trigger is, but some studies suggest that people who consistently eat junk food are around 51% more likely to develop depression than people on a healthy diet. This is a staggering number. It really makes you think if the short-term pleasures of eating junk food are worth the risk of developing long-term depression. The most likely reason this occurs is due to a mix of diet and lifestyle. If you're eating junk food all day every day, you're probably not very active. This has a cascading effect on the brain. The more junk food you eat, the worse you begin to feel. The chemistry of the brain is affected by these mood swings might be one of the triggers that leads to depression. A healthy and active lifestyle has been shown to go a long way in maintaining happiness. But junk food doesn't only have long-term effects on your brain, it can also cause irreparable damage to your heart. In fact, the most shocking part about eating a lot of junk food is that it can kill you. So if you're on the junk food diet, what we're about to tell you could save your life. One of the long-term effects of all that salt and fats in the junk food is that they can increase the amount of low-density lipoprotein, also known as bad cholesterol, in your body. At the same time, these same substances can lower your high-density lipoprotein or good cholesterol. The result of these two shifts in cholesterol can lead to heart disease and even heart attack. It's the increase in bad cholesterol along with the increase in blood pressure associated with eating junk food that can put an enormous strain on your heart. The heart is a strong and resilient muscle, which is a good thing because it literally keeps blood, nutrients, and oxygen flowing around your body. Without a happy heart, you can't survive. However, like any of your muscles, it can become overworked and tired. The problem with this is that if your biceps get tired from lifting too much weight, it just means your workout's over. But if your heart becomes tired due to you gaining too much weight, a buildup of cholesterol and an increase in blood pressure means that you die. So, you can see why it's so important to maintain a healthy lifestyle and a diet instead of loading up on junk food every day. It cannot be stressed enough how bad it is for your heart if all you eat is junk food. You'll likely be able to last a month or two on a junk food only diet before your heart gives out completely. However, if you decide to change your ways and save your life, the damage has already been done. It'll be a long uphill battle to get back to healthy living. That being said, it most certainly can be done, and the sooner the better. The rest of your life will likely be spent monitoring your blood pressure and sodium levels. You'll probably have to choose everything that you put into your body carefully, but this will go a long way toward keeping your heart healthy. The American Heart Association recommends that adults consume less than 2300 milligrams of sodium per day, and this number is for someone who is relatively healthy and making good choices as to what they put into their body. If you're eating only junk food, you're likely not making good choices and consuming many times more sodium than recommended by the AHA. In fact, one full meal of junk food would be enough to put you over the threshold, as a bag of chips and a cheeseburger gets you around 2000 milligrams of sodium between the two of them. If you're eating three meals a day filled with junk, you're consuming three times as much sodium as recommended. This is a recipe for disaster. All that salt will make you feel bloated and tired, which is your body's way of saying, knock it off with the junk food, or there will be some serious consequences. So your junk food diet has now negatively affected your pancreas, brain, and heart. This should be enough to make you want to put down the candy bar and pick up a carrot. But if not, there is even worse damage to come. What if you couldn't poop? Not only would you be uncomfortable, but you'd have a buildup of waste in your system that could cause some really nasty problems. The main reason why junk food isn't great for your digestive system is that it lacks fiber. Fiber is a key component of a healthy bowel movement. High amounts of fiber are found in foods like fruits, veggies, beans, and oats. None of those ingredients are in your typical junk food diet. What that means is that all those fats, salts, and sugars you consume get backed up in your digestive tract, where they sit until they become too much for your body to handle and they have to be evacuated. Unfortunately, they might not come out the end you want. But the real problems begin with the constipation that results from only eating junk food. Being constipated puts a lot of strain on your body, especially the digestive system, which can lead to hemorrhoids and hernias. It also has been found that junk food can be harmful to the microbiome in your body as well. You have trillions of little bacteria that do important jobs inside your guts, especially when it comes to digestion. This means you want to keep those microorganisms happy because if they're not, they can begin to cause you some serious problems. 
For example, if there are a lot of sugars and carbohydrates available, certain bacteria might begin to grow uncontrollably. Most often, the ones that do this are not the helpful microorganisms. This can lead to fewer resources for your helpful microbes. We're just beginning to understand how important a person's microbiome is, but according to some scientists, it plays a major role in several processes throughout the body. If your microbiome becomes damaged due to a poor diet, it could initially lead to a buildup of gases and incredibly painful cramps as harmful bacteria begin to reproduce inside of you. As time progresses, you might find yourself in need of a fecal transplant or any number of other unpleasant procedures to try to regrow that healthy microbiome once again. One of the most frightening risks to your digestive system as a result of consuming too much junk food is the development of diverticulitis. This disease happens when there's an infection or inflammation in your intestines. It can end up being incredibly painful and includes symptoms such as fever and nausea as your body tries to fix the damage that's been done to it. The worst part is the pain doesn't go away overnight and there's no quick fix. In extreme circumstances, peritonitis can occur, which is when an inflamed pouch in the digestive tract ruptures and spills its contents into your midsection. This requires immediate medical attention. If everything mentioned so far hasn't made you change your mind about eating only junk food, maybe cancer will. That's right, new research suggests that a diet full of junk food can actually increase your risk of cancer. In 2019, a study determined that a diet consisting of mainly junk food resulted in a weaker immune system, higher rates of inflammation, more risk of developing allergies, and higher cancer rates. Researchers think the low nutritional value of only eating junk food every day is what causes these problems to occur. If you only eat junk food, your risk for colon, rectal, respiratory tract, and stomach cancers all increase. Obviously, these are all extremely serious and life-threatening, which should give you another incentive to refine your eating habits. But some of the negative side effects of only eating junk food happen outside of your body. Eating high cholesterol foods with lots of carbs can increase acne. This doesn't just happen to teenagers going through puberty, but to anyone who constantly eats junk food. Even young children are at risk of skin diseases if they consume too much junk food. One study found that adolescents who eat junk three times a week are more likely to develop eczema than children on a healthy diet. These skin conditions are not life-threatening like many of the other effects of junk food on your body, but they can also become irritating and uncomfortable. Everything mentioned so far is an unpleasant consequence of a junk food diet. But there is something else that is unavoidable with this lifestyle. With high amounts of fat, sugar, and salts come high amounts of weight gain. Obesity is a major problem that results from consuming too much junk food. If you gain too much weight, your heart has to beat more frequently to circulate blood around your body. Your lungs need to suck in more air to get you the oxygen you need, and your muscles need more energy to support your weight. Any of these factors can eventually become too much for the body to handle and cause it to shut down. Eating junk food has also been connected to an increase in respiratory illnesses, including asthma. This goes hand in hand with obesity, as the airways and channels of your circulatory and respiratory systems become constricted or blocked. All of these factors increase your chances of having a heart attack, suffering a stroke, or developing diabetes. And the larger you become, the more calories your body will need to keep itself going. This means that you'll need to eat more, and if you continue to eat only junk food, there's only one inevitable outcome. An organ in your body will fail and you will die. So, what it comes down to is that you need to relinquish your junk food diet immediately and switch to a healthy alternative. We're not saying you can't eat any junk food. In fact, some research suggests that indulging in junk food occasionally might help you with weight loss and can be a morale booster. However, there is absolutely no benefit to eating only junk food. So, the recommendation by some nutritionists is to allow yourself a junk food meal once every week or two and savor it. But once you've had your fix, you should go back to eating healthy alternatives. That being said, there are definitely some junk food options that are worse for you than others. Here are five different ones that you probably didn't know were causing your body distress. Pizza is delicious, there's no denying it. However, not all pizza is created equal. An average slice can contain 680 milligrams of sodium, 12 grams of fat, and 300 calories. And when was the last time you had just one slice when you ordered pizza? To be fair, there are some pizzas that are made with more fresh ingredients and less grease than others, which adds nutritional value while reducing the junk part of the food. On the other hand, a fast food meal of burgers and fries has very little upside to it. One of those meals can consist of 1,200 calories and up to 1,700 milligrams of sodium, and that's not even counting drinks or dessert that you probably will have with it. Basically, one fast food burger puts you very close to your recommended daily dose of sodium and saturated fats, 
so hopefully everything else you eat that day is made up of plants and fruit. You might think having a homemade sandwich might be a healthy alternative to eating out at a fast food restaurant, but this might not necessarily be the case. Cold cut meats can contain large amounts of sodium. Three ounces of processed meat can have up to 1300 milligrams of sodium, which means that if you're consuming a large deli sub every day for lunch, those sodium levels might lead to your blood pressure potentially skyrocketing. Also, some research suggests that when lunch meats aren't processed or stored properly, they can contain nitrates and nitrites which are known carcinogens. To put it plainly, processed meats might cause cancer. If you ever watched a hot dog eating contest, you probably wondered how the contestants can have so much of the universally loved fast food treat. What you probably didn't know is that one hot dog can contain half the amount of saturated fat you're supposed to consume in one day. Also, hot dogs are full of sodium to the point where a single hot dog can make up 33% of your allotted daily sodium intake. This means those people who are eating dozens of hot dogs in a sitting are literally consuming enough junk food to last them for months. This might be an activity that is one of the worst long-term effects on the body out of any competition in the world. You can put anything that's fried into the junk food category, and one of the most common fried foods is chicken. It's not the calories that make fried chicken so unhealthy, but the amount of fat and salt in it. One piece of fried chicken can contain 34 grams of fat and 1200 plus milligrams of sodium. After just two pieces of fried chicken, you probably overshot your recommended fat and sodium intake for the day. So what is a junk food lover to do? We're going to say this again because it's so important. Eating a junk food only diet will end up killing you in one way or another. Depending on who you are and how active your lifestyle is, you might be able to live a couple of months if you only eat junk food. However, most medical professionals agree that your body would give up sometime between 1 and 10 weeks if all you ate was junk food. If you really need to get your junk food fixed from time to time, that's okay, just don't do it every day. Most nutritionists agree that having a cheat meal every now and then is alright as long as the majority of your meals consist of healthy food. In order to protect yourself and the people you care about from succumbing to one of those nasty side effects of eating too much junk food, there are a couple of things that can be done. Education is always key. Make sure to read the food levels of the things you put into your body. You might be surprised to find your favorite snack is incredibly high in salt or sugar, and it might be time to cut back a bit. Also, it's important that kids from a young age begin to think about what's healthy versus what's not. Many people who rely heavily on junk food for sustenance were never taught about the detrimental effects it can have on their bodies. Therefore, cooking meals with lots of vegetables, fruits, lean meats, and fish is a great way to start introducing others to delicious foods that are good for them. When making decisions about your own diet, some nutritionists recommend using the 80-20 rule. This means 80% of the food you eat should be healthy and full of nutrients, while 20% can be from the junk food realm. Ideally, you want to find healthy foods that you enjoy and satisfy your hunger so that more than 80% of your daily intake is from those sources, but this is not always possible. Even if you try and eat one healthy meal every day, it can have a huge impact on your overall health. Any reduction in junk food is going to be good for you, no matter how small. As a rule of thumb, if you're trying to stay away from junk food, you should cut out fried food, highly processed food, and anything with added salt or sugar from your diet. And if you're just not sure what the best options are, don't be afraid to ask your doctor. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Get two months of Skillshare free and learn new skills by using the link in the description. With 64% of US adults indulging in at least one cup of coffee per day and 11% gulping down four cups or more a day, there are over four billion cups of coffee thought to be consumed every year. That's a lot of coffee. While drinking coffee has been proven to have many health benefits, what is the effect on the body of drinking only coffee and nothing else? For this experiment, we will be drinking cup after cup after cup of the beautiful bean. Just how long could you keep going on coffee and nothing else to drink? That's what we'll find out. In this episode of The Infographic Show, what would happen to your body if you drank only coffee and nothing else? If I seem to be talking faster than usual in this episode, you'll know why. First, the good news. A cup of coffee in the morning may provide more than just an energy boost. Coffee is thought to protect against type 2 diabetes. Researchers at UCLA found that drinking coffee increases the plasma levels of the SHBG hormone, resulting in a lower risk of diabetes. A link between Parkinson's disease and coffee consumption has also been found, indicating that those who drink regular cups of java have a lower risk of Parkinson's. Researchers in Italy discovered that coffee drinkers have a 40% lower risk of liver cancer, and researchers at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard School of Public Health found that people who drink four cups of coffee a day have a lower risk of heart failure. Coffee is also high in antioxidants, which fight the oxidative damage that causes cancer. In years past, doctors warned patients that drinking coffee would increase risk of heart disease and stunt growth. 
They were also worried about the addictive nature of the energy high that follows a cup of coffee. However, it turned out the old studies used subjects who had other health risk habits such as drinking and smoking. Drinking coffee at a rate of up to six cups a day doesn't appear to be that harmful and in fact may make you live longer. One study looked at 208,000 subjects, finding that those who drank coffee regularly lived longer than those who refrained from the bean. On the downside, coffee addiction is a real phenomenon, with heavy coffee drinkers suffering withdrawal symptoms such as headaches, irritability, and fatigue. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant, producing feel-good chemicals to spread in the brain, and when our supply is cut short, we feel down for a couple of days. But on to the experiment. We are only allowed to drink coffee and nothing else. So here we go. You wake up in the morning, shower, brush your teeth, and prepare for the day ahead. The night before, you had hydrated fully in anticipation of your coffee experiment. So boil the water and pour that first cup. Sip, savor, and enjoy as those feel-good chemicals whiz around in your brain. The acidity level in your stomach increases, possibly leading to a visit to the bathroom. Not to worry, take a moment on the throne to catch up on world events. After washing your hands, you can now knuckle down to do some serious work. Coffee boosts those dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline levels and increases the heart rate. You feel like you are on fire with enthusiasm and determination to get the job done. Well done! You are riding the Java wave. As you work, you hit another two cups. You pour that fourth cup and notice your left eye begins twitching. Not to worry, pour yourself another cup. Now, after cup number five, the muscle spasms increase. You notice a caffeine tension headache and your mouth feels dry. The calories contained in coffee might cause you to feel a little raw. You are allowed to eat in this experiment, but you don't feel terribly hungry. That'll be the coffee reducing your appetite. Drifting off to sleep will be tricky too, with all that caffeine swishing around in your system stimulating your brain, nervous system, and heart. Now how dangerous this coffee drinking becomes depends on the strength of your coffee. A coffee is a stimulant and can dehydrate the body, but if your coffee is weak enough, the water content will probably be enough to sustain you but keep drinking the hard stuff and be prepared to come to a sticky end. As the days clock by, you will notice that you feel weakened by the lack of hydration and you will become wired, paranoid, and nervous. You would probably begin to increase the water volume in the coffee to counteract the dehydrating effect of the coffee. What would happen if you kept chasing cup after cup of strong black coffee? If you just kept drinking the hard stuff day after day? Well, famous 19th century French writer Honoré de Balzac did just that when he finally cashed in his chips. The chronicler of post-Napoleonic French drama was said to have drank 50 cups of java a day and died eventually of caffeine poisoning. He wrote, Coffee is a great power in my life. I have observed its effects on an epic scale. Coffee roasts your insides. So what would happen if you keep drinking coffee on an epic scale? Well, it would eventually kill you. But then again, so would water if you drank enough of it. So the secret here is that everything should be taken in moderation, including your favorite cup of joe. There are two very different stories when it comes to steroids. The first is one of hope. The other is one of overindulgence and addiction. There are types of steroids that can save your life. However, when steroids are taken in excess and without the approval of a medical professional, they can also lead to your death. Which type of steroid should you never put in your body? Let's find out. At a basic level, steroids are synthetically created hormones that the adrenal glands in your body produce normally. Hormones are chemical messengers that tell your cell which biological processes they should carry out. For example, the hormone insulin signals your cell to take in more sugar from your bloodstream and use it to create energy. The human body also uses hormones such as testosterone and estrogen to signal different physiological changes during someone's life. These hormones can also aid in the growth of muscles, which will come into play later. Corticosteroids are the steroids most often prescribed by doctors due to their anti-inflammatory properties. They have a number of applications and can aid in recovery of countless medical conditions. The other, more dangerous type of steroids are anabolic androgenic steroids. These are the steroids that bodybuilders and athletes use to enhance their muscle strength and performance. It's these types of steroids that can be dangerous if used incorrectly. First, let's understand why steroids, if used properly, can help you or even save your life. Again, remember that most steroids need to be prescribed by a doctor to ensure the right dosage and type of steroid is given. You're struggling to breathe. Every time you take in air, it feels like your windpipe has been sealed shut. You scramble for your inhaler and fumble it. The precious device falls to the ground. Your lungs feel like they're going to explode as you reach down to pick up the device. You stick the inhaler in your mouth and push down. A cool, moist mixture of air is forced down your throat. For a moment, you hold your breath and then, with a sigh of relief, you breathe out and you can now gulp down the much-needed air. Your chest heaves up and down as your lungs once again bring in oxygen and release CO2. 
People with asthma suffer from long-term chronic inflammation and swollen muscles in their airways. When the airway becomes inflamed, the body also produces extra mucus, all of which blocks the airway and causes difficulty breathing. It's the swollen muscles that the mixture of steroids and bronchodilators in an inhaler help to relieve. The anti-inflammatory effects of steroids allows the muscles to relax and the person to begin breathing normally again. When steroids bind to the membranes of muscle cells in the throat, they signal the cells to shrink in size through a series of biological processes. This causes the swelling in the throat to go down and allows the person to breathe normally again. It's absolutely terrifying for those several seconds that someone is having an asthma attack and can't breathe. Their body is literally choking them to death and depriving them of the oxygen they so desperately need. An asthma attack can become life-threatening without the aid of the anti-inflammatory signals the steroids and inhalers send to the muscle cells. This is just one way steroids can be used to save lives. Doctors can prescribe steroids for a number of different reasons. Many times, they're used to relieve uncomfortable conditions that can arise in the body but might not be life-threatening. However, without them, people would be in an incredible amount of pain and discomfort. So you're sitting at home when your eczema begins itching like crazy. The condition is caused by an overactive immune system along with environmental factors that affect the skin. As you scratch and scratch and try to relieve the discomfort, it feels like your skin is on fire. The swollen part of your body becomes so inflamed that you just want to cut off the entire body part and be done with it. Luckily, the doctor prescribed you steroids to help reduce the inflammation and return the skin to its normal state. The steroids can either be taken in pill form or by rubbing a cream on the infected area. If taken orally, the pills are broken down in the digestive tract and then diffused into the bloodstream, where they are carried around your body by the circulatory system. When they reach the inflamed site, the steroids bind to the muscle and skin cells and signal them to carry out the process to reduce inflammation. Similarly, when a cream containing steroids is applied directly to the body, they bind to the skin cells and suppress the immune response that's causing the irritation and inflammation. Although eczema is uncomfortable, there's another disease that is much more painful and even life-threatening that steroids can help with. For inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's and IBS, steroids can help reduce some of the most intense discomforts of someone's life. These diseases cause the gastrointestinal tract to become inflamed, resulting in truly nasty side effects. Medical professionals are not entirely sure what the exact cause of Crohn's or other inflammatory bowel diseases is, but the swelling in this region of the body is due to the fact that the immune system is attacking the cells, which causes irritation and swelling. Doctors think these conditions might be caused by a virus or a bacteria infecting the cells in the gastrointestinal tract, but no single pathogen has been identified as a culprit yet. In these situations, doctors will prescribe steroids that reduce the swelling in the intestines and bowels to allow waste to pass through the system more easily. If left untreated, the excretory system might become backed up with waste, which would eventually start to poison the body. In these circumstances, bowel inflammation can become life-threatening, and surgery must be conducted to remove the scarred tissue causing the blockage. Before this point, however, doctors will prescribe steroids to aid in reducing inflammation and get the swelling under control. When the steroids bind to the cells in the colon and the intestinal tissue, they suppress the immune system in the region, allowing the inflammation to go down and waste to flow out of the body. There are some side effects to taking steroids prescribed by doctors, such as an increase in appetite, mood changes, and difficulty sleeping. These are all a result of the chemical composition in your body being changed by the steroids and the process they trigger. Don't forget that steroids mimic hormones, which signal changes to occur in the cells of your body, and although steroids might be used for the anti-inflammatory properties, they also change the chemical levels in your body, which will inevitably affect multiple organs and tissues. This brings us to the really nasty things that steroids can do to you. You have probably heard that people who abuse steroids can have lower sperm count or suddenly explode into fits of rage. And although this may be true, there are some much, much worse side effects that result from steroid abuse. The type of steroids that are often misused are called anabolic androgenic steroids, which is also abbreviated as AAS. These are the types of steroids that people take to increase their metabolism and build larger muscles. AAS is typically a synthetic form of testosterone, but females and males produce testosterone naturally. It's one of the hormones in the body responsible for growth, and in males, testosterone signals the body to develop male characteristics during puberty. In women, testosterone also plays an important role in growth and development. However, it's present in much lower quantities in females than males. People have found that by using AAS to trick the body into thinking there is testosterone present, it speeds up the growth of muscles. This is by no means a healthy process, and although it can create the desired results of muscle growth, 
abusing anabolic androgenic steroids can have some serious consequences. So, what actually happens to your body if you take these types of steroids? Well, muscle mass will certainly increase, but everything else that'll happen should make you think twice before pumping your body full of AAS. Performance-enhancing drugs such as anabolic androgenic steroids are banned in most sports and competitions. Each year, athletes who are caught using steroids are fined heavily and forced to forfeit their right to compete. Therefore, it seems crazy to use steroids as the risks far outweigh the gains, yet it still happens all the time. Imagine you're an athlete who's obsessed with gaining bigger muscles so that you can be stronger and faster than your competitors. You train hard but hit a plateau so you decide to take steroids to enhance your performance. After every workout session, your muscle fibers are stretched or torn apart. Your body naturally repairs any damage which results in more muscle mass developing. But if you can trick your body into thinking it's also growing at the same time, muscle creation will increase exponentially. You pump iron all day to break your muscles down, then gulp down an energy drink full of steroids. These steroids circulate around your body and attach to your muscle cells. They signal the cells to produce more proteins to aid in the repair and strengthening of your muscles. Simultaneously, the steroids trigger cell division, causing the body to create more muscle cells. These processes can create a hormone imbalance, which may cause your body to start developing characteristics that it shouldn't while also affecting your brain chemistry. Neither the growth of the muscles nor the unpleasant side effects develop right away. It may take weeks for these things to happen to your body, but it's estimated that anabolic androgenic steroids increase strength by around 5 to 20 percent, which is why people abuse AAS. Each time you take steroids, the cells in your body ramp up protein synthesis. This is important for muscle growth but can also lead to the overdevelopment of certain male traits. This happens in both men and women who take anabolic androgenic steroids. Since your cells are working harder, they require more energy which is why you experience an increase in appetite. The feeling of hunger is just your brain telling you that your body needs more nutrients to make more energy. Anabolic androgenic steroids also trigger the body to break down fat stores and use the fuel in them to increase muscle mass and promote growth. This causes body fat to decrease drastically in people who take steroids. The steroids also signal the body to create more red blood cells to aid in oxygen delivery around the body so more energy can be made. These might all seem like good things, but it's what comes next that should worry you. Anabolic and androgenic steroids contain a combination of different chemicals. It's the ratio between the anabolic chemicals and the androgenic chemicals that determines what the steroid actually does to your body. Anabolic refers to chemicals that signal and promote muscle growth, while androgenic signifies the chemicals that promote the development of male sex traits. A steroid needs to contain both of these properties to work effectively. For example, a steroid that only contains anabolic chemicals will not allow muscles to grow at the desired rate due to the fact that the other hormones and proteins are needed to facilitate the process that can only be triggered by androgenic chemicals. The ratio of androgenic to anabolic steroids can also cause a certain negative reaction in the body to occur. Using steroids increases your blood pressure and heart rate as the body needs to circulate nutrients more quickly to fulfill the needs of the cells that are now producing more proteins and dividing more frequently. Unfortunately, both high blood pressure and heart rate can lead to heart disease or stroke. Therefore, the very thing the steroids are telling your body to do might also kill you. With a steroid that simulates testosterone, like with many anabolic androgenic steroids, there are some mental side effects as well. One of the byproducts of high levels of testosterone, especially in males, is that they can become aggressive and prone to mood swings. Again, this is due to an imbalance in chemical levels as a direct result of the steroid stimulating protein synthesis, among other cellular processes. The new proportions of biochemicals in the body affect the neural pathways and the composition of the chemicals in your brain. When these symptoms are taken to the extreme, it can cause you to lose control of rational thought and lash out in aggressive ways. This has come to be known as roid rage. There also seems to be a correlation between steroid use and body image disorders. The chemical imbalance caused by anabolic androgenic steroids might distort your view of your own body and push you to work out more to lose fat you don't have and gain more muscle. This is a vicious cycle because if your brain is telling you that you don't look good and that your body should be more muscular, you'll likely take more steroids in order to reach an unobtainable body image. This leads to steroid abuse and is relatively common for people who use AAS without consulting their doctor. In these circumstances, steroids are not just messing with your biochemical processes, they have also become an addictive drug. Anabolic androgenic steroids themselves might not be classified as addictive, but what they do to your brain chemistry can make you crave them as if they were a drug you can't get enough of. While you gain muscle and the biochemical processes in your body are altered due to the steroids, other dangerous side effects are occurring. The liver filters blood while also balancing nutrients and metabolizing certain chemicals, such as the complex molecules found in steroids. 
When you take steroids, it forces your liver to work overtime to break down the chemicals in the drugs and the byproducts generated by the increased levels of protein synthesis happening around your body. Protein synthesis, like most cellular processes, generates waste, which also needs to be broken down by the liver. What this means is that steroids overwork the liver. People who abuse steroids never allow their liver to rest or recover, which leads to complications or liver failure later on. This is when steroids become life-threatening. It doesn't really matter if anabolic androgenic steroids give you larger muscles if your liver fails and you die. There are also other more noticeable side effects of taking anabolic androgenic steroids. Females might start growing hair on their faces where they normally wouldn't. Their voice might deepen while their breast size decreases. Other changes such as an enlarged clitoris and irregular menstrual cycle also occur. All of these side effects are a direct result of the chemical and hormone imbalances that happen within the body as a result of taking anabolic androgenic steroids. For males, there are some much more strange physical side effects. Abuse of anabolic androgenic steroids can cause gynecomastia. This is a condition in males where the breast gland tissue increases due to an imbalance in the hormones estrogen and testosterone. When this happens, breasts grow in size. Gynecomastia usually affects both breasts but sometimes only causes one to grow extra tissue. Either way, this condition does not provide more upper body strength and is therefore not the desired result of most people using steroids. Although most anabolic androgenic steroids mimic the hormone testosterone in some way, they are not always a perfect substitute. In fact, abuse of steroids can actually lead to hypogonadism, which is a condition that causes the testes in males and ovaries in females to stop or produce very small amounts of sex hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. When this happens in males, it can cause the testicles to shrink. In both sexes, it can render the person infertile. Again, this is a perfect example of how steroids can produce big muscles but with consequences. Is risking the ability to have future offspring worth increasing your muscle mass and becoming stronger for a brief period of time? For some, it is. But for many younger athletes who start taking steroids, they don't know the risks or consequences these drugs have on their bodies later in life. Some of the most severe consequences of using anabolic androgenic steroids are the long-term health effects they have. In order to build bigger muscles, your body needs to increase hemoglobin production along with a number of red blood cells to deliver more oxygen to your cells. This oxygen is then used to create different proteins and energy. However, increased levels of blood cells and hemoglobin can thicken your blood and increase your chances of having a heart attack even after you stop taking the steroids. Anabolic androgenic steroids are also known to have long-term effects on your cholesterol levels. Research shows that these steroids can reduce your HDL cholesterol while raising your LDL cholesterol. Basically, it increases bad cholesterol overall throughout the body. Again, this has nasty consequences for your heart and can lead to several other complications. The use of steroids to increase muscle size and strength is just not a healthy alternative to working out and eating a well-balanced diet. Athletes and bodybuilders will take steroids to gain an advantage over their competition, but at a great cost to their bodies. If you take anabolic androgenic steroids, there's a good chance you'll not only experience unintended physical side effects, but your brain, heart, and liver will suffer as well. The short-term gains are never worth the long-term damage that anabolic androgenic steroids can cause. That's why they should only be taken when prescribed by medical professionals and in specific circumstances. This video was made possible by Wix. If you're ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. Kids are often warned about the dangers of swallowing chewing gum. It will stick in your gut for seven years is one popular myth. It can make its way to your heart, some have even said. So what's the truth? Gum doesn't seem to dissolve by simply chewing and chewing. So can you swallow this tough candy or are there dangers if you do? That's what we'll be exploring in this episode of the Infographics Show. What happens in your body if you swallow gum? Before we answer this question, let's look at what gum is actually made of. Chewing gum has been around a long time, as far back as the Aztecs, a culture that flourished in central Mexico in the post-classical period from 1300 to 1521. They used to chew a gum called chicle, which was made from the latex sap of the sapodilla tree. It was chewed as a way to relieve hunger, freshen breath, and keep teeth clean. Chicle was also used by the Maya, the indigenous people of Mesoamerica, an area in southern Mexico, who used it as a filling tool for tooth cavities. And chicle is what was used to make chewing gum in the West as well as other natural products such as beeswax or paraffin wax. But following World War II, chemists learned to make synthetic rubber, which replaced most natural rubbers that were in chewing gum. These synthetics included polyethylene and polyvinyl acetate. The last US manufacturer to use chicle is Glee Gum, who still sells their products online. 
But today, most gums that you see in the candy stores are made with synthetic rubbers. In addition to the gum base, chewing gum contains flavorings, sweeteners, and softeners. Softeners are ingredients such as glycerin or vegetable oil that are used to help the other ingredients combine more readily and prevent the gum from becoming stiff. But it looks like in most cases when you chew gum, you're essentially chewing flavored synthetic rubber. But then, once the taste is all gone, you spit it out, right? So what if you swallow it instead? When you eat food, there are a number of processes that go to work in your body to turn it all into fuel. First, there's chewing, of course. Chewing food helps to break it down into smaller pieces so it's easier for the stomach to go to work on digesting it. And as you chew, the food is also mixed with saliva, delivering enzymes that help break down the food. Once swallowed, the food saliva mixture hits the stomach, where the super strong stomach acid turns it into even more of a mush. This allows the food to pass through the rest of the digestive tract smoothly. But gum is a whole different story, because as strong as your stomach acid is, synthetic rubber is too much of a match. Synthetics are used in all kinds of products, including fiber optics, sealants, cling film, fuel, sporting equipment, roofing, bottle stoppers, tires, and even explosives. But don't worry, gum can't be broken down by the body so it won't make you sick. Your saliva enzymes and your stomach acid will do their best to try and digest the gum base, but they won't be able to. But that doesn't mean it just sits in your stomach, never to be released. Like your school teacher might have warned you, your body will treat the gum the same way it would any other food it can't fully digest, such as corn and sunflower seeds. The muscles of your digestive tract move it through your system and eventually flush it out a day or two later, along with everything else. BuzzFeed Health reached out to gastroenterologist Dr. Lisa Ganju D.O., Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City, to get some inside information on what goes down in the gut when you swallow your gum. No, it won't stick to the side of your intestines or build up a giant gum wad or anything like that. It's similar to swallowing teeth, which can make it through your intestines pretty much intact, said Ganju. The only thing worth being concerned about is getting stuck. If the wad is actually too large to fit through the opening of your stomach from your esophagus, but it's unlikely you'll be able to swallow a wad of gum that big in the first place. So there might be rumors of the risky results of swallowing gum, but no, swallowing a piece of gum doesn't mean it will stay in your body forever. Of course, that's no reason to go crazy and start gulping it down by the pack. The more gum that your body has to process, the higher the likelihood that it'll build up and clog your digestive tract and an intestinal blockage can trigger stomach pain and constipation. There's a lovely name for this blockage, a bezoar. An 18-year-old Israeli woman once suffered from a bezoar that blocked her stomach as reported by Australian media outlet ABC News. Doctors discovered that her stomach was jammed packed with a large ball of undigested chewing gum. She had been swallowing as many as five pieces of gum a day for several years. They had to break up the mass before using a tiny net to remove it bit by bit. So it looks like there is a risk if you swallow multiple pieces of gum. Chewing gum isn't necessarily bad for you though. And in fact, studies have shown that chewing gum can actually help relax you because it helps reduce levels of cortisol, a common stress hormone in your saliva. And it's a popular pastime according to US Census data and Simmons National Consumer Survey, who say 174.74 million Americans use chewing gum or bubble gum in 2017. And it's a trend that shows no sign of stopping with the global chewing gum market forecasted to make sales amounting to 32.63 billion US dollars in 2019. This video is sponsored by Athletic Greens. Support your energy, focus, gut, digestion, and immune system health with a nutritional drink that contains 75 different ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I'm really excited that AG1 by Athletic Greens is sponsoring this video because it's helped me to seriously simplify my health routine. And I know it can do the same for you too. If you're like I was, you're taking a ton of different vitamins and supplements each day. It was hard enough to remember to take one, let alone multiple throughout the day. AG1 by Athletic Greens changed all that for me though, by covering all my nutritional needs in just one single scoop. Honestly, it's that easy. Instead of a bunch of tablets and capsules, I now have one single scoop of AG1 in 8 ounces of water, first thing in the morning before my coffee, and then I'm set for the day. That's really it. Not only does it start my day off right by drinking a whole glass of water, something that's extremely important as you're about to see, but even better, because it's mixed with water, it's more efficiently absorbed by the body. I originally started taking supplements to aid with recovery after working out, and I found after drinking AG1 for a while now that it does that, but so much more too. My digestion is better and I feel like I have more energy sustained throughout the day. So much that I rarely need an afternoon coffee now to get that late day focus back. 
So what are you waiting for? Go try AG1 by Athletic Greens for yourself by going to athleticgreens.com slash the infographic show and start simplifying your health routine just like me. Athletic Greens is going to give my community a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packets with your first purchase. Now, about how necessary that water you mix with your AG1 is. It's time to lose that quarantine 15 or so. You're scanning the internet looking for the latest diets. This all radishes diet doesn't sound very appealing, so you move on to the next one and wait, what's this? Lose a ton of weight with the no water diet? Well, that sounds easy. What could go wrong? Maybe you'll just go for a run instead. But what would happen if you actually stopped drinking water for a week? For one thing, water is in a lot of things. You might think dropping water from your diet is easy, but it's probably the first ingredient in anything you're going to drink. So you're essentially going going on an all-no-liquids diet, which makes you thirsty just thinking about it. But going without water for a week is even more than just uncomfortable. It can be dangerous and, depending on the circumstances, even fatal. Day 1 you don't have to do anything too extreme to find out about this one. You might even have gotten most of the way there. You know those hot days when you're busy and running around and there's just no time for self-care with all those errands you have to run? The next thing you know, it's 3 p.m. and you haven't drank anything since you left the house. And suddenly you feel a little woozy? A full bottle of Snapple later and you're ready to take on the world again. That was your body telling you to drink something. And it knows how to make itself known. Anyone who doesn't drink and feels the signs of dehydration will likely experience excessive sweating, dry mouth, a headache, possibly nausea and fatigue, and maybe even dizziness if it gets bad enough. These symptoms aren't too dangerous unless they distract you when you're driving or handling heavy machinery, and the odds are anyone who feels them will take the hint. But this isn't true in all cases. What's it like to go 24 hours without food or drink? A lot of people do it pretty regularly. Most intermittent fasters do drink during the fast, but that's not the case for certain religions. Jewish people in particular have several fast days a year where they go from one sunset to another without eating or drinking, but at least they get asleep eight of those hours away before the hunger and thirst settles in. If you asked most of them how it makes them feel, they'd probably say, grumpy. The symptoms of the first day are more unpleasant than anything. Suddenly, everything takes more effort. You just want to lie down and sleep until you can eat and drink again. Although, you might spend the entire day of Yom Kippur in the temple praying, which is another way to distract yourself, but the odds are you'll only get past one day without drinking without too many ill effects. But that might not be the case if you keep at it. Day 2 for most people who fast and abstain from water for a day, the end of the day is a huge relief and they immediately down the nearest liquid, but if you kept going, things would get unpleasant in a hurry. Those symptoms that made the previous day miserable, they're sticking around and only getting worse. Odds are, someone on the second day without water would wake up with a splitting headache and forget about coffee when you wake up. Staggering to the bathroom, they would likely notice something startling. Their urine would be a darker shade of yellow. This happens when the urine concentrates as a result of the body not taking in enough water for it to process waste. A day without water would speed up this process and is a sign that your kidneys are working overtime. While the odds of kidney failure aren't high yet, this does put you at a much higher risk for painful kidney stones, and those can ruin your day in a hurry. This is also the part of your no water adventure where you're going to feel fatigue take a real toll. At this point, the dry mouth has become a constant companion, and you might feel like the rest of your body is drying out as well. It's pretty common for people who don't drink water for an extended period to report their eyes feeling dry, but it's not clear if this is related related or a psychological effect. Odds are you'll be feeling pretty dizzy as well, especially if you're not eating. Many common food items have a lot of water in them, especially most fruits and vegetables, so that can alleviate the symptoms of dehydration, but it's also sort of defeating the point of seeing exactly what would happen if you abstained from water for a week. However, some of the food items also can have the opposite effect. If you've ever eaten salty or spicy foods, you know they only make you want to drink more, so stay away from those potato chips. But some people might be able to go without drinking at all. Those foods that are packed with fluids are also often packed with nutrients. Some people believe it's healthier to get their water from fruits and vegetables and not tax their body by drinking too much water. Is this actually true? There's no evidence that drinking water is less healthy, but doctors agree that people can stay hydrated without water. Just make sure you keep on top of that water intake from your favorite produce. The fruits and vegetables with the highest water content include watermelon, strawberries, cantaloupe, peaches, oranges, cucumbers, and lettuce. Question is, how long can you actually go? This is sort of a choose-your-own-adventure thing because how you behave during your no-water fast is going to play a big role in how long you can hold out. Your body consumes the water it has stored up to keep itself running, but it doesn't always consume it at the same rate. If you're staying home in an air-conditioned room and watching Netflix, your body isn't exerting much energy and it won't consume much fluid. However, if you're trying to go about your daily life on a hot summer day, running from place to place, that lack of water is going to catch up to you very quickly. But by day three, the odds are you'll be feeling the pain no matter what. Day three. 
How important can water be to the body anyway? Try this fact on for size. A majority of our body weight is water. Water makes up around 60% of the average person's body weight. In children, it's up to three quarters, and your body is going to start using that water up fast. That's why people who go on crash diets combined with heavy workouts wind up losing a lot of weight very quickly. Their body is losing water weight at a speed that isn't sustainable for long term. Your body is constantly shedding water through sweating and urinating, and that doesn't stop now. Odds are that on your third day without water, you'll be too exhausted to do much, unless you're scarfing fruits and vegetables, in which case you might not notice much at all. But while the standard external symptoms might seem stable, that's not the case for what's happening inside your body, because the damage that's happening now is largely invisible. Your body has been adapting to the lack of water in a less than healthy way since the start. As your body dries up, you sweat less because your body is conserving moisture. This means that your body can't regulate heat as well and your temperature starts rising. This is why people who dehydrate in hot desert climates tend to struggle much more, because their bodies quickly reach the critical mass where their organs start to shut down from overheating. If that's the case, day 3 might be the end of the road, as you die from a dehydration-induced fever and organ failure. But that wouldn't make for a very interesting video, so there's still a long way for you to go and a lot more nasty effects to experience. The lack of moisture in the body starts to affect everything, including your blood. It's going to start getting thicker and circulating less, meaning you have less oxygen in your system, and to make up for that, your heart starts beating faster. And that's rarely a good thing. You might even feel a slight surge of energy at this point, making you feel like you're out of the woods. People who have been dehydrating for several days often report feeling less thirst after a while, although the surface symptoms like a dry mouth remain. But this is actually where the lack of water starts becoming the most dangerous. As your drying out continues, you'll have lost roughly 4% or more of your body weight from water alone. This will result in intense blood concentration and your blood pressure will drop. You know that lightheaded feeling? You're very vulnerable to fainting at this point, which means that any risky activity, driving, operating machinery, riding a bicycle, even walking down a flight of stairs, might come with an increased risk of this experiment coming to a sudden and violent end. Not that you're likely to have the energy to do any of those things anyway. You'll have stopped sweating almost completely without rehydrating, which means even slight exertion will make you overheat quickly. At this point, people might start feeling very sick, and any doctor would tell you hit the abort button because from here it might get a lot rougher. Someone who goes three days without drinking and then rehydrates would likely feel a lot of residual weakness until they build their water weight back up. But that first drink of water is going to be the sweetest thing you've ever tasted, and you'll probably be running back and forth to the bathroom for much of the day. You'll likely see all body functions return to normal, including the color of your pee, within a few days. But the same can't be said for those who proceed to the back half of this challenge, because your body is entering the point of no return. Day 4 you know how sometimes you have to make some tough budgeting decisions? Hours get cut back at work, so it's necessary to decide what's more important, the vegetable budget for the month or that copy of Elden Ring. Well, that's an easy decision, but it's nothing compared to the decisions your body will have to make once you reach day 4 without water. Moisture is necessary to survive, and the body doesn't have enough energy to maintain blood pressure at a level where you'll stay conscious, so it's necessary to shift what remains to the places that matter most, mainly the heart, the lungs, and the brain. After all, if your body keeps breathing and the brain keeps working, maybe Maybe you can make your way out of this, but that means the non-essential organs start losing function, and that doesn't just include truly non-essential organs like the appendix or gallbladder. It means that some of your body's most important systems start to shut down. Your kidneys have been struggling for a while, as that dark urine made very clear. Your body isn't able to successfully process and flush out all that waste matter, and this leads to cellular buildup on the kidneys. Not only will your urine quickly become darker and urinating might become painful, but the lack of successful elimination can make you sick. Millions of people around the world suffer from kidney failure, needing a transplant or dialysis to flush out their systems, and anyone who doesn't give their kidneys the tools they need to do their work might find themselves at risk of blood poisoning. And that's just the start of organ failure. Another area of water deprivation that could be a massive pain in the butt, literally, is what it does to your digestive system. You might notice when you don't drink enough, you become constipated. That's probably going to start early on in your no water diet, although how noticeable it is depends on how much you'll be eating during this whole ordeal. The less you eat, the less work your system has to do, but that also speeds up the malnutrition and lack of energy for your body. It's also likely that the no water diet might result in blockages in the digestive tract. Some might be able to resolve themselves with rehydration, but others might even require surgery to get their bowels moving again. And without moisture, the tissue of the intestines might start dying just like the kidneys, leading to permanent damage. This is probably the last chance to turn back. Day 5 
Anyone who's made it to this point in a no-water diet and isn't rehydrating through other means has likely caused serious damage to their body. Most people who do this are either those on extreme hunger strikes for political causes or those who don't have any choice, and those who find themselves in extreme situations, being stranded on an island or in the middle of a desert, often resort to extreme solutions. Some may actually make things worse, like drinking seawater. While this might look refreshing, it's loaded with salt and actually makes the dehydration worse. The human body can't process liquid with such a high salt content and it'll lead to your body losing more water than it takes in. By now, you won't be in good shape at all, and the dehydration will be taking its toll both inside and out. Your body will be conserving energy wherever it can, and that includes drawing moisture from the skin. Your skin is likely to become dry and shriveled as you continue to lose unhealthy amounts of water weight. You'll have stopped peeing entirely at this point, as your kidneys are too weak and damaged to produce urine. Your muscles will be suffering from a lack of energy and moisture, and you'll likely be dealing with extreme cramps and spasms. If you're in a hot environment that's sapping moisture quickly, you'll likely be dead already. But if you're in a relatively stable situation, the odds are you're still alive but in rough shape. Anyone who starved themselves of water for five days will likely be too weak and in too much pain to take more than a few steps and will likely be drifting in and out of consciousness. And your own body will also be working against you. If you're not too exhausted to move and you're in an air-conditioned location, at least your body won't be using up too much moisture, right? You might think you're essentially in a holding pattern at this point, but there's one massive factor that's going to cause you to keep losing those few remaining drops. You know when you exhale in cold weather you see all that moisture collect on the glass? Haha, <laughs> you just wrote a swear word in it. Fun Sometimes. Anyway, that's because every time you breathe, you're exhaling moisture, and that adds up quickly. This is why it's so important to keep drinking constantly, because you're depleting your body's stores even when you don't notice. That's a big part of why you keep waking up with a dry mouth and feeling like you need to drink in a hurry. Your body loses moisture every time you breathe, and you never stop breathing. At least not yet, but that's not going to stay the same for long. Day 6. Still with us? Good but things are getting pretty rough. If someone made it to day 6 without refueling on water, odds are they're on their last legs. A person in this condition couldn't really decide to just start drinking again and be fine. Their body has suffered serious damage and would need a process of intravenous rehydration over an extended period for the body to start repairing the damage. There would likely be more serious damage to multiple organs that might require surgery or transplants to repair, but the body is still desperately trying to conserve whatever moisture it has left, and that means dangers in some unexpected areas. But it might be hard to see them. Having trouble seeing properly? That's because your eyes are heavily water-based and your body has started to draw on them. The eyes of someone who has been starving themselves of water will likely be sunken back into their skull, shrinking and giving them a skeleton-like appearance. This won't result in blindness at this stage, but it might seriously impair vision. Not that it'll be easy to keep your eyes open or call for help as the extreme dry mouth has had another unpleasant effect. As people die of thirst, their tongues start to swell up. Not only does this make it harder to talk, but it can actually sabotage the person's survival, making it challenging to swallow water properly if someone comes upon it in the desert. And that's nothing compared to the most dangerous point of failure. Your brain is probably the most complex part of the body, a bundle of countless nerves all firing constantly and a little disruption in it can ruin the whole machine. But like every other part of your body, it requires moisture to keep running. As the body runs out, the brain begins to shrink within the skull and sustain damage from the dehydration. But this comes with a more immediate threat. As it pulls away from the skull, there's a chance that this will cause areas of the brain to tear and cause a fatal brain bleed, which will bring an abrupt end to the no water experiment before the final stage. So at this point, someone who has gone without water for six days is in constant pain, their organs are failing, their senses are going, and they'll need serious medical intervention if they're going to survive. So what's coming on day seven? Surprise, surprise, it's nothing good. Day 7 Will everyone who goes without water for 7 days die on day 7? Unlikely. Your body doesn't govern itself by time, it just knows how much water it's lost, and 10% of your body weight is the limit in most cases. This can be reached in 5 days under most circumstances, but it can be extended to 7 or more days under controlled circumstances with minimal exertion. On the other hand, this milestone can easily be reached in 2 days in hot conditions, or as little as 11 hours if you're running in hot weather without rehydrating. But at this point, the question isn't if something is going to kill you, it's which which organ will do the dirty deed first? Let's look at the most likely suspects. Suspect number one, the kidneys. These organs are amongst the first to fail when your body starts rationing moisture because they take a while to kill you after they fail, but that bill's coming due. Ever since they stopped working and you've stopped urinating a few days ago, your body has been retaining waste products. Toxic sludge has been slowly building up in your body and it's reaching critical mass. If it goes untreated, the unfortunate person who has abstained from drinking for a whole week will likely die of the ill effects of 
these toxins, but sometimes the rest of your body will get you first. Your body is completely unable to regulate temperature at this point, which means you're extremely vulnerable to high temperatures. Your body's essentially running a high fever at all times and that leads to organ damage. The liver is one of the most essential organs in the body, functioning as a processing center for your blood. It's unable to filter it if it doesn't have the moisture needed to function, and if it starts failing, you'll likely die of blood poisoning very quickly. The heart and lungs are likely the last to go, and anyone who's gotten this far is likely to die of something else before these get them. Sounds like the no-water diet is probably a pretty bad idea, to put it mildly. But that raises the question, how long can someone actually go? Assuming someone goes without any nutrients, no food, and no water, it's estimated that 8 days is probably the maximum length for survival in most circumstances, but some cases have lasted as long as 21 days. Are those people medical miracles? Quite the opposite. These people are usually dying already. They're often people in hopeless conditions, either with a terminal illness or extreme brain damage, with no hope of recovery. Depending on the laws, it's sometimes possible for the person or next of kin to request all nutrition and hydration to be withdrawn to allow them to pass more peacefully. This was the case in the controversial case of the brain-damaged Terry Schiavo. These people often last longer than most cases without water because they expend extremely little energy from the start, usually just lying in bed and breathing due to their condition. Meanwhile, a person finding themselves dying of thirst in a desert would likely be desperate to get out of the situation and work themselves to death in a hurry. But water, when consumed, is nothing short of a miracle worker. Hunger strikes without water usually only end one way and are pretty short. But other cases of hunger strikers have gone on much longer as long as people stay hydrated. A study in the British Medical Journal says hunger strikers should be able to survive longer if they drink a liter and a half of water per day. They recommend adding half a teaspoon of salt to replace lost sodium, but keeping your body hydrated does most of the work of keeping this machine running. Does every liquid work the same way? Pure water is going to have the best impact because sweet drinks can actually make you feel thirsty again in a shorter time. They can also lead to your body becoming addicted to the empty calories they provide. But drinks like herbal tea or juice have a very high water content, and other drinks like vegetable juice can actually provide essential nutrients to those on a liquid diet. But keep an eye on the ingredients. You want to find ones without salt, because adding sodium to your liquid can dehydrate you pretty quickly. So can any drink with caffeine, and it might look refreshing, but that tall, frosty mug of beer isn't going to be suitable for water. Alcohol is a diuretic and makes your body remove liquid from your body more quickly. It's the worst thing a dehydrated person can drink, save seawater. The good news is, the body lets you know when you're getting short on moisture. Headaches, increased sweating, and dry mouth are all probably the first signs, but dizziness will come soon after. If it gets to the point of muscle aches, you probably need to get drinking in a hurry. The good news is, for most of us, water and all sorts of food with high water content are readily available. So maybe that all radishes diet wasn't the worst idea on the list. Check out what would happen to your body if you lived in the ocean, or what would happen to your body in space for more bizarre experiments.